Yeah. Okay, we still have a people joining in, so um, I'm gonna take a few minutes for having everybody in. People are still coming in, so uh, welcome. Uh, this is the uh, ML Flux Management Project Data Tech Workshop in hybrid form. So I hope uh, everybody on Zoom can hear me. Um, I don't see anybody, but I'm assuming you can. If you can't, uh, we have the chat up also. So uh, anybody, anybody is typing, confirm. Um, that's good. OK, wonderful. So yeah, we're going to wait a couple of minutes. Um, just coffee. Uh, So again, um, I'm going to step back to uh, that you can see me also. Um, so super exciting. Uh, it's been a long time to have a data tech workshop, either hybrid or in person. So we're really, really excited to all this meeting today. Uh, it's nice to see people. It's nice to see people on Zoom too. Uh, familiar name, no faces yet, but uh, familiar names and new, new faces also. So. Uh, we're going to start with a few uh, announcements uh, for people online. Please uh, stay safe wherever you are. Um, here, I want to point at the bathroom first. <laughs> well, by a right, we're right around the, not the first uh, hallway, but the second hallway on the right is the, uh, we're in earthquake country. So if anything happens, uh, and we have an earthquake, uh, the first thing you do is duck, hold that cover, so all your desk where you can when the shaking stops. We exit uh, to an area that's called the assembly area. So you go around the building. So oh, there's a door. I don't know which way is better, but yeah, that door, that door. But uh, so this is uh, west, east, north, south. The evacuation area is in the southwest corner of the building. So right here. Southeast corner, sorry. Southeast corner. Uh, and um, I think that's about it. Um, we have a we put together a program based on feedbacks we got from the community. Right, this morning, we're going to focus on talks, uh, some on uh, so first the welcome introduction, then discussion on uh, maintenance calibration. We have a coffee break, and we'll talk about that transmission uh, from your site. Uh, and then we'll have uh, a talk on self uh, review QIQC process by Hassan. We'll have lunch, and then we'll go visit uh, a site, uh, a fairly new site that was. So set up in February. Uh, that's in a ag ecosystem. Uh, we we'll meet with the that owner and the farmer that give us a cheap overview. There's a cheese, they have they make their own cheese, so the cheese shop, the park. Uh, <laughs> should be, you know, the idea is to co stimulate community engagement with all of you. And then tomorrow morning we start again at uh, 8:30, uh, and we'll have uh, three presentations uh, from site teams, short presentation. And again, this meeting is on the informal side, but it's really interaction between you. No pressure, questions, uh, raise your hand online if you want to ask questions or write in the chat. We're all monitoring, all being the data, the, the MI Flux management team is monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, we'll take questions on. If you have questions in the room, raise your hand and then, but we really want to engage, right? And if you have questions, we're here too. Uh, so tomorrow we're here, tomorrow morning, uh, informal talks about uh, Experience from site teams and uh, the challenges that site teams are uh, uh, meeting to uh, maintain the quality, their site, how they operate, what they what they would like to see as a model. We'll discuss about a program that we put in place during COVID, which is called the site visit, 
light program where they're really focused on data processing uh, that you generate uh, from your sites. Uh, and then uh, we'll have an overview of the favorite acronym, BATM, uh, Biological, Biological Ancillary Disturbance. Uh, Disturbance, uh, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> metadata. Uh, acronym that came up like, I don't know, uh, by Deb eight years ago, she loves all of these acronyms. And then we have uh, uh, Gilberto will tell us about uh, the one fox processing. So Gilberto in the back. Uh, uh, and then we'll uh, visit the American Frost Calibration Lab uh, in the afternoon tomorrow. Tonight we have dinner a reservation uh, at a cafe, I guess. So it's a restaurant, pizza, brewery, brewery is important. Uh, at Jupiter uh, at 7 p.m. So we should be back uh, from the site visit around, I want to say, 6, probably. So that leave an hour for people to you know, get things in order and get ready uh, for uh, dinner. Anything uh, I forgot. Okay. okay. Um, anything online? Oh, agenda no. business. Okay, wonderful. So for people online, uh, you have we are using Zoom uh, for the meeting, so you can mute unmute to speak. Uh, there's a chat, as I said, you can send message uh, for questions. And then uh, if there's technical challenges, you cannot use the chat or you cannot. Uh, Talk to us, you can email uh, to uh, mp webinars at lbl.com for, .gov for technical issues. So, because a lot of you are first time attending this meeting and first uh, new uh, uh, to the AmeriFlux community, we wanted to really uh, get a little bit of uh, history, right, on, on AmeriFlux and tell you a bit about what the AmeriFlux communities and what the AmeriFlux management project is. And hopefully for some of you, that's going to sound very familiar. For others, it's going to be a, a little bit new, right? So one thing uh, we have to remember is the AmeriFlux network of sites. Uh, it's a coalition of the willing that are using the ID Commerce technique. That's the main tool that we use uh, to uh, measure greenhouse gases and energy fluxes, uh, the land atmosphere exchange right, of uh, energy, water, and carbon. It started in 1996 uh, with 12 sites. That sounds uh, more than 25 years ago. Uh, it's really a bottom up uh, network, right? I mean, we're really measuring uh, from the ground up. Uh, there's no standardization for the AmeriFlux network. Some uh, community within AmeriFlux have standardization protocol, like uh, Neon, that's my uh, colleague. Uh, but basically, the PI. Uh, decide what type of instrumentation they want to uh, use. Uh, and we're not uh, dictating how much instrument specific people should be used. Uh, so as I said, it's a coalition of the willing because people opt in, right? It's a voluntary basis uh, to join the AmeriFlux network and to share data. And we have different data sharing policies that are tailored to the site team needs. Uh, we really function as a community where we share knowledge. So it's something we're trying to really foster, especially after the disconnection that we had during COVID a little bit. I mean, that's the way I feel at least. Uh, promoting collaboration and networking with uh, regional network around the world. So we have a strong partnership with ICOS, our sister network in Europe, uh, and also uh, other network in South America that are uh, sub uh, affiliation, primary affiliation now uh, in Brazil, for instance, or other network, but they also uh, decided to uh, join uh, the AmeriFlux network community. You can see a uh, history of the AmeriFlux network uh, at the link that I posted here. Um, it was written by uh, Denis Valdocchi, um, Bevlo, and uh, yes, Dave Rollinger. Uh, and it's a really nice history uh, for us, like me, that was not there. And, uh, the, 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 uh, so the challenge that we had uh, as the network was created and evolving is to maintain long-term sites and to ensure uh, intercomparability between sites. DOE we recognized these challenges in uh, the early 2010s and decided to create uh, the AmeriFlux management project that is uh, managed by Berkeley Lab 
and that's the team that we have here. Uh, so it was established in 2012 uh, when the American Flux Network was going down as a community. Uh, there was less than 100 active sites. Uh, and since we've uh, took over the network, I mean, the growth has been probably beyond our hopes, uh, and which comes with challenges as well, but uh, fivefold in number of sites. So we, I don't know if 613 is the number as of today, but it was as of a few days ago. Because uh, it's growing, and then uh, the scientific community has grown to more than ten thousand users. So it's a really, so far I see it as a really good uh, solution. We're <coughs> a team between us and uh, UA and, yeah, and myself. So, yeah, cool. right. <coughs> so hello, uh, my name is UA. Uh, I am currently acting as the data team lead for the team, and. Yeah, Ian Sebastian, I was just gonna walk you through all of this. And we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. So we are a coalition of the willing, but we somehow arrived at this uh, large network. We, now, we are now at 600 plus sites. And there are a number of uh, products that we put out as part of the AMP team. The main one is the base data product. And this is what you all submit. We QQC it and then we just put it out for the community to consume. It has to be part of a standard, of FP standard, which I will talk in more detail later. Uh, and we are currently one of the data sets with like long records. So we have like 80 sites, which are kind of more years. Uh, there's the FluxNet product, which we are trying to wrap up on. This is a, a product which has gap field uh, partitioning so added value on top of the base product, and we are trying to get it, get more sites involved in it. Uh, Gilberto will be giving more details on the one plus uh, work. So yeah, that's going to be it. Venom is what Sebastian had mentioned earlier. It's all the metadata, anything else about your site, which is yeah useful for understanding the measurements. So. We have a lot of ecosystems covered. Uh, we are still a lot, like a lot of the sites are still based in the US and Canada, but we're trying to grow this out of these two countries. So we are working actively to try to uh, partner with other teams in Latin America. And so far, this is currently what we have in terms of uh, teams within the network. We obviously still have a lot more work to be done. And yeah, so the, the, the end team, so this is the management project. Uh, we have sub teams, uh, talk about the data team, the tech team, and then we have other teams like the core sites. These are sites which we deem are valuable and we have uh, contracts uh, and partners, partner with them to support them technically and help them out. They also have more stringent requirements like they have to submit data every quarter. And then we have teams to uh, help with the outreach, to grow the net network, obviously. And then we have other stakeholders. And then there's the Science Steering Committee, which currently has uh, 70 people. So these are people, PIs from various sites across uh, the network. And they help us with things like what variables should we add, what are the standards, uh, how do we quantify some of these measurements, how should the network grow in terms of directions, steers, things like that. And Sebastian so mentioned that we partner a lot with ICOs. Uh, the FluxNet 2015 product is uh, a strong product that we put out together with ICOs. So we work closely in the, with them to uh, arrive at agreements with how the standards should be shaped. And yeah, we continue to partner with ICOs on a lot of things, including the processing. And then there's, there's other networks which we partner with too. Uh, Neon is also a network which we have a lot of sites as part of the Marathon network. And then there are, there are other global partners that I'm not going to just mention one by one here. Okay, so back to you. Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I realized that um, I started it on, uh, I didn't even introduce myself for uh, US, so, but I guess we'll hear a lot from us. Uh, uh, 
at some point. Oh, yeah, back up. My head is cut. Um, so the way uh, Ant and the Ameriflux community uh, interact is through uh, its service, commitment to the community and expertise. So that's why I said, please engage with us. Engage with us. We're really here to help. What we do is we set a uh, norm for data sharing, for format, for uh, units. Uh, we uh, reward engagement by site team, right? We have, I don't know if we posted it actually or not, but we have a level of service based on the data policy you have. So that's going to come up. I think it was reviewed by the science steering committee as the as a uh, engagement with team, with team uh, depending on the uh, activity and active active level of engagement with the community. So site visits, for instance, that would describe uh, loaders, equipment, rapid response system, and so on. Uh, we stimulate and facilitate productive uh, community interaction through meetings and webinars. So we hold webinars and there's, uh, there's um, uh, a YouTube channel that Ameriflux has that's all the record of our past uh, webinars and future webinars. So a lot of information that we try to keep uh, up to date. Uh, as UA mentioned, we create data product services and community activities. Uh, so for instance, we cater our um, demure that we've had. We have the, and I think we'll talk a little bit about this, but those seniors are really uh, uh, from the community up, right? I mean, it's not something we decide from the top. We really engage uh, all the community and ask you what are the uh, needs uh, that uh, the community sees and where area of growth, uh, both in terms of uh, science and also community practices. We have a central hub for information initiative and uh, uh, best practices um, across the uh, Americas and worldwide. So we're gonna describe a little bit of some of those services, uh, technical services, data services, outreach community. And, um, and as you mentioned, we support directly the operation of course sites. That was part of the mandate we had from DOE in 2012, where we had to support long-term operation of a set of course sites, um, which, in 2012, it was difficult for PIs to uh, take your funding for operation of, uh, of sites, right? Because the OETPT likes to be very project oriented, short term, five, three, five years. Uh, so, I'll, oh, yeah, so, I'm going on here. so that's the map of the core sites. It's not fixed over the years, it's been changing a little bit. Um, you know, we used to have a few more sites. Uh, so that's, uh, for those who are new, uh, the name of the sites uh, uh, clusters might not be familiar, but uh, we all talk about tickers, right? It's not like we're working in the stock market, but that's very similar. Uh, <laughs> but so there's 40, 14 core site contracts that represent 42 sites. So some clusters have one site, some of them have six sites, seven sites, two sites. So it depends on uh, the, the, the teams, right? But we support directly both uh, trying to support uh, their operation through uh, funding uh, site technicians for the clusters, but also they have, as you mentioned, more stringent uh, uh, requirements on the network, but also uh, we ask them to help spread that community right, and potentially act as an ambassador for the network. And we are, yeah, and the uh, evaluation of the renewal of the core sites is something we do on a regular, semi regular basis. So one of the, so I'm gonna now talk about the services that the tech uh, team uh, provide. So one of our core programs that was established at the onset of the uh, Ameriflux network in 1986. Can I interrupt for just a second? If you, if you go back one, there's a question in the chat. What is the color of the, of the map? Oh, someone was, sorry. The background. This is a terrain based on, I don't know, there's a map standard. Oh, uh, you don't think it's vegetation cover or? Right. Yeah, vegetation cover, yeah. That, that's the different types of uh, ecosystem classifications. Yes, right, that yeah. were, this was actually used to, to pick the core sites to be representative of, uh, of a wide range of conditions. But it's a little bit different than the eco region that Neon mm -hmm. has selected, right? So that's it's right. really based on vegetation. Right. Will it be from the model? Uh, it, it's, it's part of it, but it's not just, just that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so one of the core program, um, as I said, this is um, a map that uh, I didn't update, but it gives you the idea of the program that was established uh, in uh, 
96, uh, when we took uh, the management of the network over in 2012, I mean, we started to do in-person site visits, meaning we were going uh, to visit the sites to evaluate instrumentation and uh, processing. Uh, there's a lot of description, it's a little bit small uh, on the screen uh, for uh, how to request a site visit at the site in person or uh, with the site visit 2.0 program that we, we spun up uh, during uh, COVID where we're focusing on the processing. We actually do this now on a remote. So meaning we don't, ask, we don't assess the instrumentation of the tower, but the way you do what you think you do your processing, your data processing. Uh, but we're trying to uh, typically um, up until COVID, we were trying to do uh, between six and 10 sites per year because it's a, it's a pretty intense uh, program, right? Between the engaging the site, preparing the visit, two weeks on site, uh, processing the data, writing a fairly extensive report. Um, each report were about, with figures, about 50, 60 pages long. So it's a lot of work, very thorough. Most people find it really, really uh, helpful. In, because of the growth of the network, this uh, is not sustainable because we'd like to uh, imagine if you do 10 sites per year, you have 600 sites, the return per site is 30 years. So that's not going to be sustainable. So we move to a more uh, remote um, approach, uh, which is, we call the site like program, which Sigrid will describe in details tomorrow. Well, we should not spend too much time on this. One uh, other service that we have is um, uh, on the technical side is we provide calibration gases. Uh, two sites. So if you need to calibrate, and we'll talk about it uh, in the next talk, uh, when you calibrate your oil gas, you should request cylinders from us. It's a free service. Uh, we spend a lot of time making, blending, uh, characterizing the cylinders, and we ship them uh, the all over the network. It's more complicated for Panama, for instance, but we, we've done this in the past. Uh, we do this with Canada, we've done this for uh, Brazil. Um, we also um, have uh, power sensors as well to help you calibrate uh, and benchmark your, your sensors. Uh, we have loaner instruments, meaning if you have issues with an instrument uh, that needs repair, we've seen a lot of issues right now with the supply chain, right, where repair calibration of instrument by manufacturers ever. And in order to minimize the gaps of your data set, contact us and we'll, we'll share with no new uh, equipment. It could be Ergas, it could be Sonic, it could be US. Uh, we have also a profiling, uh, portable profiling system. Uh, if you want to characterize the storage at your site, if you have stored canopy uh, vegetation, so if you, and you don't want to buy one because you don't know if it's valuable or not, we can loan an equipment to you. We've done this, I think, to uh, with Tom a few years back. Um, so it's a really uh, valuable asset. Of course, uh, a lot of us in the tech team, uh, like Steven, uh, Hassan, and Sigrid, who is stuck in Seattle, but she's going to be here this afternoon, and are experts in any program. So, questions, contact us. Uh, I think, um, yeah, the amerifirst tech at nbl.gov. You can ask us questions about uh, challenges that you have. If you want to request equipment, same. Uh, and also, we have. Um, a lot of information on safety, right, that we can provide in the system. A new uh, opportunity we've put in place is we are now sponsoring people to attend uh, tower safety training, right? And so if uh, at a site you need, most of us have not done this uh, over our career. It's really, really valuable because when everything goes okay, it's fine. But when something goes wrong and you don't have the training, that's where things can get really, really dicey. So we encourage everybody to take safety classes for tower climbing. If you climb a tower that's taller than six feet, for instance, um, talk to us and then we work with you. Another system that we have is the rapid response system. You know, that's a full edit covariance and micromet uh, system that we can loan up to three years to allow people, PIs, to take advantage of special opportunities, wildfire, recovery, droughts, insect infestations. Uh, it really takes time for PIs to write project pro proposal to submit this to funding agencies and get the equipment in place. This is really available. So uh, 
and they're so same. I mean, I put dash tech, I let the dog of obviously something. I've put three of the deployment we've done in a burn and burn area in New Mexico after qualifiers in 2016. We've done a um, wetland succession um, in Florida, um, finishing a ecosystem recovery after severe drought uh, for the pinion juniper ecosystem in Utah. Uh, system is going to come back in November. We've done also this in Arkansas, rice field uh, with Ben Rocco. Okay, now we're going to switch to the data support. Okay, so I mentioned about this earlier uh, that we have three products. So yeah, base is what we call QQC transmit data. We really see it every one to two months. Uh, housing has been primarily doing that, but we are trying to start a self-review process because we are scaling up and obviously having housing do all the work is crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. And then there's one flux and flux net which uh, Gilberto is helping with, and we are trying to get more sites in that uh, pipeline as well. BIF is a format that we put out for Bedum. Uh, Bedum is kind of hard to work with, so we are experimenting with different things all the time. Uh, if you have feedbacks, uh, let us know. And this is the IP standard I was talking about earlier. So the, the base format and the flux net. Uh, format both use this format, so it's oops, it's, okay, yeah. So it's on the website. Uh, there are different descriptions of different variables. How to go about it? Uh, it's time series data. There's ways on how you uh, label missing data. And then there are there are the names of the variables, and then the qualifiers depending on like where your sensors are. And this is BADM, which is biological ancillary disturbance and metadata. Uh, you measure different things from where your site is located, uh, what time you're, you're using for timestamps, who's with the teams, uh, what instruments are used. And then there are things like, like if you measure soil or things with vegetation, and those all fall into this umbrella of that. So we have a lot of sites, and this I would say is what we call the window to the network now. Uh, it's a little hard, so we have been trying to we've been trying to tweak this uh, site search tool all the time. And this is the latest iteration of it, so you can filter on different things. Like uh, let's say there's a filter here, like if you filter by GPP, REQ, NEE. And then you can build like the conditions you want for it. And then you can view the number of sites. It's going to refresh here. And then uh, there's the data availability as well that you can see for each site. So which site has data, what's being measured. And then there are other filters as well. Like you can filter by variables specifically, like what variables you want to use, uh, data policies. And then there are other things like, yeah, where is it located? So it's pretty detailed at this point, maybe a little hard to work with, but it's pretty powerful. And then there's this uh, site sets tool, which once you search up for all the, the conditions that you want for sites that you can put together a collection of this, save it and you can reuse it the next time. And then uh, you, if you like work with this paper or something and you want to build citations, there are tools that to help with that. So data policies, we have two data policies that we support at this point. There's the more open CC by four policy, and then there's the legacy policy, which is what we used to have. Uh, the difference is, I think one is you have to like, involve the site PIs if you are using it for publication, like you have to actively contact them, and then you have to acknowledge their funding sources as well. And if you're using data from both policies, uh, the, obviously the more restrictive policy is going to be in play. All right. So there's a committee that we established very recently, I think it's 2021. Uh, but this is the DEI committee. 
Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's a volunteer group within the network where we try to establish best practices around like safety, uh, inclusion, like hiring people. And the, the network really is going to benefit with uh, this kind of practice. We are a little new to this, so we have been leveraging existing uh, guidelines from other networks as well. Uh, Christine's been helping with it. If you have questions about it, you're welcome to uh, contact her. There's an email at the lower left link. We do have a resource that we pull up for uh, inclusive and safe work. And then there's, there's meetings and workshops that we do around this topic as well. EMURS is something uh, that started in 2018. This is a concentrated effort that the network uh, puts together depending on what the network themes are important topics or what we need to pay special attention to. So we started with the year of methane in 2018, 2019. And then there was a, a product that we released as a consequence of that effort. There's the Tuxnet methane product. It's not on the Marifax website, but it's on the Tuxnet uh, website. And then 2021 and 2022 was the year of water fluxes team year. I don't think we had a data product for that, but we put a lot of sensors and equipment to help sites uh, measure things on water. And right now we are on the year of remote sensing. So Kong is not here, but yeah, he's driving that. So I don't know what's going to come after 2024, but yeah, I can think of all that in the years to come. We do have a lot of events that we help with. Uh, there's the AGU town hall that we have. I think we're gonna have one this year as well. There's the PI meeting, which is slated to happen in October. I think, yeah. It's not called the PI meeting anymore. It's everyone is welcome. <laughs> okay, sorry. Everyone is welcome. So everyone is welcome. <laughs> I got corrected on that. But yeah, we do have an annual meeting. Uh, there's a flux course, which uh, is more for students. Uh, it's a two-week meeting at in Colorado. There's one happening this year, but I think that that I suppose uh, Dave Moore is helping with that. There's a Fluxnet meeting that's coming up in July. I think it's in the Czech Republic this year. And then we have a lot of webinars, which Sebastian had pointed out earlier. There's a lot of resources to help guide you through the various things that we talked about. There's also the Avir Career Workshop, which uh, is partnered with the Fluxnet broader community. And I think that's it. So, anyway, there's a question yeah. about the BADM products. Uh, yeah, the question yeah. about irrigation practices. Yeah. Uh, is that reported in Madam? Who else can report that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm working on it. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 So, you're working on it. I'm working on the response. <laughs> so, then you'll be responding to uh, <laughs> Sandra's question. Ah. Yeah. But, yeah. If you have questions or anything at any point in time, reach out to us. We are happy to help. And what are we doing? So we're good. We have uh, time for questions, yeah, questions. interactions, the group, or uh, that's a generic overview of uh, what we're doing. We're going to dig in a little bit more uh, thoroughly in the next the next two days, I guess. Uh, but the idea is really, really uh, engaged. Talk to us. Um, on the theme here, um, on the theme year, uh, methane has been extremely successful, but we, I think you were showing it was 2018 to 2020. It's still ongoing. People still use those uh, methane sensors. So what we did is we bought a lot of methane sensors. It was, I don't know if it was luck or, uh, I don't know if it was meant to be, but now because of the shortage of parts, I mean, all our methane sensors are out all the time. We are, I think yes seven or eight uh, sensors, uh, they keep flying off the shelf, right? Because uh, it's really, really an important resource. And it's, those are expensive sensors, uh, you know, $45,000 each, uh, I like all the 7,700 uh, all. So it's really very good asset. <laughs> you said you're, you don't have any spare 7,700s because you're lending them out. Well, they, are, they come back, we, if they've been out in the field for a while. Do um, you have a feeling for why so many 7700s are failing at the moment? I guess, it, you know, if you look at when they came up on the market, so the early version was 2010, and I think to 
the community didn't really embrace those systems until 2015, 16, when it started to really grow. And those are aging, right? So as they're aging, uh, they're getting to either, not really end of life, but that's where you should do more business. And the growth has been such with all the USDA program, the grants that mm -hmm. everybody wants to measure. I don't think the production by the manufacturer is keeping up with QHC. They're standards. having a real hard time. Giving They're advice. having a tough time. Mm -hmm. so. um, we've had three 7,500 sales because of water leaking in them. So, like, actually, we had one fail twice for water leaking. <laughs> And after sending that back to like all for repair, and they, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's an issue. Um, <coughs> for the year of water, we worked with a lot of sites. So, as like you mentioned, we were the idea was to really push um, and site to measure more extensively water in the soil in particular. So, we bought, um, I want to say, probably. 150 soil sensors. Uh, we got some um, um, pressure transducer to monitor water table depth at sites that were for uh, yes. Uh, I mean, Tom got a lot of sensors. Uh, so <laughs> we're looking forward to get them into a base very soon at some point. Uh, and then we also bought total precipitation sensors because a lot of sites still use you know tipping buckets. Uh, which do not do a good job for uh, solid precipitation or so on ice. And so, um, especially in the Arctic, so that was a big investment. I mean, DOE invested uh, you know, almost $300,000 in equipment just for that effort. So it's a very significant effort. And the point I'm trying to make is this was grassroots organically generated from the community. Right? So if you have ideas, please do engage. Same for the yard remote sensing, right? We, uh, being the community for what would be a good effort in terms of remote sensing product that we could support. Uh, we have ideas on LIDARs, on CIF, uh, that are coming online, and we're thinking about doing as well to the community. But if you have ideas, please do engage. Right? This is really for you as a community. Uh, to... And I should open the floor. Yes, stop talking. Well, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you guys collaborate and communicate with ICOS pretty frequently, um, and I'm wondering what the Communication structure is across other sub networks of FluxNet, like Asia Flux or Aus Flux. Do you guys have like a central representative that reaches out to you ever? Uh, I'm sure they often need help because uh, obviously, you know, this network is well equipped. I'm just curious kind of what that relationship is like. So I'm just, uh, I know that to a Jugato. Jugato just went to uh, ICO's uh, headquarters in Italy, I guess. Not headquarters, but uh, Dario is there. And one, one, of, one of the three, right? One of, sure. one of the three have been headquarters. Yeah, so uh, with, with ICOs, we engage pretty frequently. We develop all the um, codes and all the standardization efforts that we implement for AmeriFlux are always in coordination. So OneFlux is, is sort of shared between ICOs? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. This, this, this is code that we wrote together. It's, uh, if you look at the code, there are uh, fingerprints from everyone <laughs> Good. in ICOs, AmeriFlux. So for, for these two networks, it's really tightly integrated. Uh, with other networks, we are starting to engage a lot more. So with Osflux, for instance, they are starting their effort to uh, implement OneFlux for Osflux, for instance. So uh, they have a few uh, developers that are starting to uh, participate in the development of OneFlux, for instance. And uh, there are other networks that have been uh, starting to engage uh, with us on, on that as well. So the standardization efforts for data sets for codes, uh, for um, how to deal with issues like leaking sensors yeah. that affects everyone. Uh, so those kinds of things are good motivations for us to engage with these, uh, these networks. Uh, and as Sebastian mentioned, with the networks in the Americas, we are uh, kind of much more in, in touch kind of on a, a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, there's a lot of um, new collaborations that we're trying to uh, start with networks in terms of uh, data processing. So all of the Ameriflux services are kind of extended through all of the networks in the Americas, for instance. So this this kind of uh, gas that collaboration going uh, a little bit too. Was that kind of what you had in mind? Or? Uh, I guess I'm, I know that Asia Flux has, has many sites. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, how, I, I don't know, if they ask you guys for, for recommendations or for 
I don't know if there's sort of a central communication hub or if it's well, more ad hoc. Respond to this with Christine. Yeah, well, so it also depends a little bit on how an individual network network is funded. So we are pretty lucky, you know, like you can meet more than half of our team today. So we have that actual support to put in the time to develop the code, to develop the technical know-how, and some other networks don't don't have that same funding, you know, support. Maybe they are more focused on creating community and actually making sure black scientists find each other and, and learn from each other. But it's, yeah, that kind of also depends on how capacity is to engage with the networks. Thank you very much. Later, the FlipNet co-op group, it's a brand new funded project that is the intention is to, to try to coordinate with all networks that are, are not being so engaged. So it's a specific objective. Have this worldwide engagement, the flux net With with nature flux specifically, mm -hmm. there uh, there are the challenges that you mentioned, uh, but there are challenges with data sharing policies as well. So mm -hmm. the leads for Asia flux they have been trying to advocate for more open data policies, so um, these sites can actually join all of these efforts. There is a little bit more resistance uh, from individual side teams to, to share their data openly. And, uh, and we understand it's, it's kind of a difficult uh, uh, situation to operate in with funding and, and getting all the sites going. Um, but this, this is one, of, uh, one other factor. So the leadership for Asia Flux and uh, other Asian networks, Japan Flux, Korea, Korea Flux, they all have uh, kind of this challenge with engaging with individual teams. And, Trying to convince them that it's uh, a good idea to join these networks and engage with open data sharing. So I, I think it's a slower paced uh, development, but it's it's moving forward uh, for Asia for as well. Um, and just one addition is in as far as I'm going to get to right? 2018, I think we wrote a lot of protocols uh, across ICOS and Atlantic Flux that were published in a specific issues. I should know because I did one of them. I don't remember when uh, that was on radiation. But a lot of us are involved in uh, standard protocol uh, and instrumentation across, I want to say, ICOS or SPLUX and uh, So, yes, there's a lot of coordination. It could be always more. But, um, before jumping onto the next uh, talk, um, it'd be nice maybe to have. Uh, Maybe we can, it's a small group, it's a group small enough that maybe we can introduce also really briefly, uh, either online, either you unmute, oops, you unmute and then you say your name and your affiliation, uh, very short description, but quickly, right? Um, it'd be nice to have people to know a little bit who we are as a group as we work out that community. Thank you, Russ. Uh, shall we start uh, in the room? I guess so. John? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Lenters. I'm a research scientist with the University of Michigan. Um, just started there recently, actually, after transitioning from Michigan Tech. Um, if any of you know Chris Vogel, who's run the UMBS Tower for, I think, 25 years now. Just recently retired, so I'm both the new Chris Vogel, but <laughs> I have big shoes to fill, so lots to learn. Chris <laughs> Vogel 2.0. Yes. <laughs> I'm Marco Montemayor. I work at Woodlow Climate Research Center as a research assistant. We work on the permafrost pathways project where we're looking to uh, fill gaps in uh, the network in the Arctic. Hi, Patrick Murphy, uh, also at Woodwell Climate Research Center. Uh, previously worked with Mariflux sites in Arizona and North Alaska. Uh, so, very familiar with a lot of names around here. Okay. My name is Alfonso Sambrano. Uh, I am a system engineer. I am working in the Smithsonian on Panama, uh, handled the Edicovarian Tower that is in DCI. It's an island in the middle of the channel of Panama. Uh, I start a position uh, with the NG Tropic Group to manage the, the tower. So I, I has three years under the, the tower. Hello, my name is Stephen Chan. I'm part of the Ameriflux tech team here at uh, Berkeley Lab. I also wear a hat as a data provider and have my hands in um, six or seven Ameriflux towers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later today. Thank you. 
in particular the one that we're missing this afternoon. You can blame Stephen. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, JJ Yapka. I'm a part of the UC Santa Cruz Payton Lab, working under Adina Payton. Um, and I'm uh, an academic researcher, but I upkeep uh, three towers in the Elkhorn Silhouette plants. Um, we're building two more soon. I'm uh, Jeremy Forsyth. I'm a PhD candidate at Clemson University in Tom Allen's lab. Uh, we and also the data manager for we've got seven sites in the southeast that we're uh, up going to add a few more in the next couple of years as well. I'm Joshua Clegg. Um, I work on three neon towers uh, based out of Fresno. Um, I've been working um, as a tower tech for five years now with neon. Um, and it's really exciting to be here engaging with Ameriflex because um, I have enough time spent on the towers managing all the instrumentation. So this is really, really good and uh, um, exciting time to be engaging with all of you. Uh, I'm Fiona Ryan, uh, she, her. I am a member of the Ameriflex data team here at the Berkeley Lab. I'm Daphne Zutu, I'm a technician in Dennis Bell Daphne's lab down the hill at East Berkeley. Um, I help manage the Delta Towers. We have seven of them over a variety of land covers. So restored wetlands, um, alfalfa, corn, and yeah. Hi, I'm Gilbert Daly. I work with Daphne. Um, we're part of the Office Lab. Um, USTON was on the map. That's the Maricopa Square site. Um, <coughs> I've been doing any compliance for, I don't know, 25 years now. So um, I'm one of your resources here. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm Robert Short. I'm a PhD candidate, also in uh, Dennis Baldocki's lab at, at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. Cool. Hi, I'm Gilbert Postarello. I'm part of the data team here at uh, Meriflex. I do a lot of the post processing of the data. Uh, Code for one flux, the data standards, and all that fun stuff. Danielle Christensen, part of the Mariflex team on the data side. Um, if you submit data, you might hear from me. Help run that pipeline and help out with data on the various sources. Okay, so when you submit data, I'll help you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Seth Hong Go. Um, I'm a part of the data team um, at the Apple Lab. Um, so I'm working with the team to have. Uh, uh, checking the status of uh, variables and uh, and um, the status of uh, work uh, work plus but next I'm Christine Buchner. I'm the program manager on the project and if you join an event uh, in person or online that's when you hear from me and, and also if you are at a course I probably hear from you. My name is Andres Santos I'm from Brazil I have a PhD in environment engineering and now I am in the climate science uh, department and work at uh, Ameriflux in the Bay. Hello everyone, I'm Hao Sen Chu from Berkeley Lab 2 and also uh, Ameriflux data and tech team uh, doing a lot of stuff end to end. Uh, if you ever submit a data, uh, you probably receive an email from me, so I handle all the direct quality control for all the Ameriflux data sets, so I'm going to Talk a little bit about that later today. And good to see everyone here. Thank you. So, uh, 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 if you register the site, you've already heard from me at some point. I handle that part. Uh, I also handle a lot of the back end infrastructure. So, if you need like APIs, things like that, if you have other kind of complex infrastructure network to interface with our systems, I can yeah, talk to me about that. Um, before going online, so uh, UA is also leading the data team. Uh, from Sebastian B. Road, uh, I lead the tech team here, and I'm Margaret Thorne, uh, DP uh, for the American Foundation. It's really cool to see you all. Uh, let's go online also. Um, the people started to introduce themselves, or you want to unmute? Um, shall we start with Cassandra? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Cassandra Key. I should be up to meet you guys soon. Um, just having issues this morning, but um, I'm a third year PhD student at Indiana University Bloomington. 
I'm helping uh, Dr. Kim Novick, who is in charge of the U.S. Morgan Monroe uh, Flux Tower site on a NSF funded cover crop project to explore interactions between carbon, nutrient, water, and energy cycles and agricultural systems. Very excited about it. There's gonna be three or four towers and I'm gonna be in charge of uh, data management for that. Right now the structures are up, but it's not sending data. So uh, trying to figure out what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. So this is great. <laughs> nice to meet Marco? you. Uh, and I'm going to call people from the list I see, which might not be the list you see. So, uh, Marika. Hello, good morning. Um, hi from North Carolina State University. My name is Marika Aguilos, and I'm managing the Insecore flux sites here in North Carolina. And I'm a researcher, a flux manager, and a tower technician rolled into one. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth? <laughs> Elizabeth once, Elizabeth twice. Okay. Um, Kim. Oh, hello. Hey, yeah, hello. Yeah, my name is Dohi Kim. I'm a PhD student in Texas A&M University uh, with Dr. Nur Asko Nurmets's lab. Um, I'm studying about actually isotopic flux, but we have a, a ready. Um, site in the Texas, which which is ready for register, and that also has combination of adicobarians and isotopes. So, um, from this workshop, I want to learn about like how to apply my isotope plugs and Ameris plugs data systems in it. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, we don't have a lot of those. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Jack. <clears throat> Hello, Jack. Uh, Andrew. Oh, Andrew. Hi, <clears throat> I'm a Andrew Wimet from the. I'm at the U.S. Forest Service now. I just recently got a position there. Uh, I'm based in New Hampshire, but I maintain towers across the Northeast, uh, mainly associated with the Howland. Um, tower where there's been a lot of turnover in personnel. So I'll be the, the lead there for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, sorry if, if I mispronounced your name, Shaman. Okay. Uh, Jack? Oh, there's two Jacks. Yeah. Oh, there was two Jack. Um, Jack Geist? Okay, so it's on the chat. Oh, it's on the chat. Okay. Um, Benju? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Benju Bania. I am a second year PhD student at Texas A&M University, uh, working with Dr. Asko Normans as well. So uh, right now I'm managing data for a North Carolina site, and we are also setting up a new site at Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rowan? I'm Rowan. I'm a pretty new tower tech for NEON. I work with Josh managing three of the NEON towers in California. Uh, I don't know what that is. So, uh, Katie? Hi, my name is Katie Ramora. Um, I am a support scientist with USDA ARS in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we currently have two towers in agricultural systems looking at business as usual versus um, aspirational practices for USDA's LTAR network. Um, thank you. Um, and then, Katie. Hi, my name is Caitlin Sturgeon. I work at the University of New Hampshire as a research technician, and I help maintain a local uh, flux tower that we have in Durham. Thank you. Uh, so whoever didn't, uh, I missed. Rachel. Oh, Rachel, of course. Rachel, sorry. Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Hollegrass. 
I'm part of the AMP website team. I'm a user experience designer. So occasionally I uh, hope to have contact with you to understand how well the uh, website tools work for you and to see you at the annual meeting. Thanks. And Jack, guys, do you want to go? Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Jack, it looks like you're having uh, audio issues. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, on the first um, discussion uh, that we're going to have on uh, instrumentation maintenance and calibration. So, and it's really, really to engage you, right? I mean, it's very generic, but I'm, we want to hear back from you, right? So, IDV. Uh, eat up a little bit on our conversation, but we have 30 minutes. I I'm going to go quick to this, but I want to hear from you guys. So, oh, oh. oh yes, yes. okay. So, uh, a little bit of uh, interaction part. So, use your phone, look at the URL that I think Stephen is going to copy and paste in the chat. Uh, tell us a little bit where uh, the site is. So, you can scan directly with your phone. I don't know, hopefully, it will work. Uh, and then hopefully that works with the video. Yes. If you are in person and you need to jump on Wi Fi, the LBL, wi LBL visitor is unrestricted and open. And you can jump on that. I've also put it in the chat for folks online. Everybody grabbed it. Um, and Stephen, the results, I guess. Yes. Can you grab the, the link? Arm, which is my site is now in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so folks go to the left and hit a new sticky note. Sebastian, you can follow along. Yeah. So add a sticky note. You can add in your site name or site ID and then move it around, move your sticky note onto one of the two maps. Um, as you can tell, you have full edit access to the background. <laughs> that around. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. I'll try to keep it in place. We found one. Clever, I guess. Missed. Nice. Okay. Nice. Okay. I just love it. Somebody put mine. That's great. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just go fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, at least it's a fun exercise, right? We're breaking yeah. the ice. We're breaking the map. Yeah. We're breaking everything. So that's good. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, besides the moving back, we have a pretty decent representation, I mean, special representation. Uh, Churchill, uh, that's probably online. Churchill, yeah. Josh. So, like in, in Churchill, like Colombia Churchill? Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It was CF1 and CF2 previously, and now we're hoping to reestablish CF3. Oh, that's wonderful. The world is shifting. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a magnetic field shift that's happening live. And the Yukon, 
It's also you no, can't just go to the yeah. Yeah, hit two and yeah. That'd be the bottom. Yeah. And then Scotty Creek. Scotty Creek? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about it. Yeah. We'll talk about it. <laughs> okay. Scotty Creek is the one you did or Stephen Creek? Or Stephen? Stephen. Stephen. Scotty Creek. Side visit reports. We'll discuss. <laughs> Okay. I want to say we're getting close to stable. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so thank you for sharing. It's nice to see that yeah, we have a lot of people from uh, a lot of places. So that's that's fantastic. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some. Um, why do we care about maintenance and calibration, right? Uh, those are the first step that we do if we want to collect high quality data uh, and to make sure you collect high quality data, you need to make sure that you have strong maintenance uh, program in place and calibration program in place also. So we'll talk a little bit about this and we ask you about how you do this and just um, see we can do to help on that. Uh, of course, uh, so we all cite uh, that providers, right? All of us, uh, within even an IFLOPS team, have sites also that we manage. Right? So we know all the difficulties uh, of and the challenges that, not all, some of the challenges that we uh, site team uh, meet. So of course, good documentation of maintenance during site visit. When you go to your sites, uh, help with cost processing that accurate, you see, right? When you receive those nice people from Hassan saying, what is that point here doing? Uh, and you say, oh yeah, damn. The bird was on my radiation sensor at fun. Um, that's better to, uh, to try to filter some of the data that you send to us. Uh, and also good documentation of calibration procedure helps with internet uh, comparison across sites uh, and across networks, right? If we have a standard that, that we can all uh, compare to. So just a quick, um, there's a, which I found um, pretty, Awful uh, definition uh, by the French uh, International Bureau of Weight and Measures, the Bureau des Poids Mesures. Um, and what's interesting is they talk about, you can read the definition, I'm not going to read it, but they talk about how you compare uh, your measurements to standards. So it's really a benchmarking exercise. And the concept they introduced here that's interesting is measurement uncertainties, right? Through calibration, you can also assess the uncertainty of your uh, measurements. So that's that's the main uh, point uh, that they do. And why do we calibrate uh, our sensors? Because of course, it'd be fantastic if our sensors were all perfect. Uh, there's um, the manufacturing process of different sensors introduced uh, BIOS across sensors of uh, different specs. Right, that's where manufacturers come with uh, specs. Uh, for uh, different type of sensors. Um, different sensors will respond to different, different ways for different conditions um, as well. Um, and sensors will be affected differently if you operate at high, high altitudes in the Arctic, uh, in the tropics in Panama, or in uh, mid latitude. Uh, and sensor age also, if they are interesting characteristic change over time, so you need to recalibrate them. Uh, so, you have the uh, ideal response of a sensor that we'd love to have. And unfortunately, that's often never the case. So we have different type of uh, uh, sensor response compared to the theoretical values, right? It could be an offset as shown on the upper uh, left. Um, it could be a response with a gain and an, uh, uh, you know, that's meaning that your value that you're measuring are changing or so that's not something an offset, but there's a gain involved in the calibration process, or it could be a non-linear response right, of, your, of your sensor. So all those needs to be characterized through calibration. Um, as I said, no uh, sensor is perfect, but ideally what we have is when we have uh, sensors that are imperfect and we introduce calibration for different conditions, we can actually get pretty close to the uh, ideal response right, uh, of, uh, of those sensors. 
Um, why do we calibrate? Uh, because we want to minimize measurement uncertainty. Uh, and we also want to quantify and control errors uh, those measurement processes to a level that meet the spec defined by the manufacturer. Um, so question to you all. Let's try this again. <laughs> so how do you decide when you calibrate? Sorry. <laughs> and there's no wrong response, right? Everybody grab the QR code. It's a different. Every year, when something looks bad, and the boss tells me to, <laughs> based on time frame specified by instrument manual, that is all over the place. The <laughs> sensor gets replaced. So new sensors, the sensor drifts. Um, yeah, the schedule as well as the change in sensor or noticeable issues. Yearly at the beginning of the calendar year to minimize disrupting time saving during the growing season. After sensor chemical change, weekly for air gas, annually for corn. When I get free gases from America. <laughs> <laughs> Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Who's Calvary Burger, please? Chris told me to. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sensor chemical change? So sometimes uh, some of those sensors are drier, right? Or so some chemical to dry the around, around the. <coughs> of the sensor itself. And so when it gets saturated in water, starts to accumulate and saturate the environment where the cell is, or the sensor yeah, is. Just swap. So you have to swap it. Okay. And then that would be water's potential recalibration. Uh, did I miss anything? Start of each field season, when fed of six months, Yes, okay. Stable? Uh, I think. Okay, that's great. I mean, that captures a lot of. Uh, what's interesting to me is we all have different approaches. Right? Uh, everybody responded a little bit, but what they are doing is and there's no wrong or right, or right, right? It's just that's it's practicality. There's, you know, how often do you have access to your site? I mean, Churchill might not be the site you go every week, right? So, yes, you validate some of those. Uh, challenges. So, um, and what I add is exactly what you guys uh, uh, wrote, right? I mean, typically you may require a recalibration when you purchase a new instrument uh, after a maintenance or repair, uh, after a specific amount of time as it apps, right? Uh, if you run a sensors for I don't know how many hours uh, and then you have to calibrate it uh, before or after critical measurements. So we talked about growing season. Like probably better to do your calibration when uh, before fluxes and growing season are starting to go with gangbuster. Uh, when observation appear questionable, that's, that's what we saw also. Um, and then, so instrument indication that don't match the output of similar instrument. Like let's say you have your measure water vapor with your area, and then you have a relatively many sensors and they widely disagree by the indication uh, of something that needs to be done. Um, yeah, or well, uh, manufacturer recommendations, right? So, um, a few examples, 
the off sensors are off self calibration. Uh, Joe, you are saying who calibrates the other? Okay, uh, if you have, for you instance, have yeah. that's right. If you, it doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. It means you have something that does it for you. So that's what the Campbell uh, CPEC 200 uh, close pass yes, sir, they have, have a this band you can use the zero and span to calibrate. Well, the, other, the other point to that question, though, with the Lancor 7500s, in our calibration history, most of the errors just come from somebody making a mistake when they calibrate it. <laughs> rather than the sensor being bad. So um, there's that. that yeah. Consider that's why when we do it for the 500s at the Great Lakes sites, I yeah. don't touch them. <laughs> if you calibrate all the time, yeah. then you have to be really, really good at it. Because in our experience, a lot of the errors we have in our data is because something went wrong when somebody calibrated something. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a great point. Um, how did you try that? How did you? So that's, and that's part of the conversation we should all have, right? I mean, oh yeah, I noticed that my, I did a calibration, I looked at the new calibration coefficients and what the difference, what the heck is this? I probably did something, they do change, but they don't change drastically, right? Um, and for different sensors, we are all have experience about which part of the calibration we should be paying well, attention to. Well, something said for that too, in that a long continuous record of data that is, has a problem with it, but it's a fixable problem. It's much easier to deal with than a record of data that's got a bunch of different pieces that all have different problems that you have to treat individually. And so even if your calibration is off by an offset or a gain factor, it's all the same for the entire year. That's really easy to fix. But if I have every month a new calibration that has a new problem, that's really hard to fix. And I'm probably not going to get it right anyways. And I would rather have the data that's sort of consistently wrong <laughs> rather than what is that's that's random, randomly wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's the part that's hard to, if you have to correct. For and that's issue. something to do with the soil sensors too. If you know, if you dig them up out of the soil to calibrate them, then every time you put them in, you're totally new. I mean, in my experience, most of the differences in the measurements is because I stuck them in the soil slightly different than last time, and it has anything to do with drift calibration. Um, and so balancing, it's you know, a it's long, it's continuous, undisturbed data set versus digging them up and discovering that they're right on where they're supposed to be. Yeah. It's kind of along the lines of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, because if you fix it, you might break it. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, I mean, and this is a problem with especially longer sites in that, um, yeah, if you've got 10, 15, 20 years of data from an undisturbed sensor, that's pretty nice. Whereas I get a bunch of chunky stuff from sensors. We've got you know, ax sites that get pulled twice a year for tillage. Those data sets are horrible to work with. So, you know, leaving things be as long as you can maybe <coughs> compare them with something else, it may be a better way of going at it. Yeah, so the, what I'm getting is from uh, what I'm hearing is there's not one solution fits all, right? It's all you have to cater to your sites, your need. I mean, Ike sites are notoriously good. We for so we, the site that Stephen and I run in Oklahoma, which is an Ike site where they do a winter wheat, which would be winter wheat, but they do rotation with alfalfa, with soybean for years, every six months. When they're tilling and planting, we have to put them out. So mm -hmm. now we've decided to move away from that paradigm, leave them in place, cover place. And they don't like it, they have to go around it, it stays in the soil. And honestly, who calibrates their soil moisture sensors? I'd love to see this. I mean, have you? Daniel? Well, when I was doing it, I calibrated my. <laughs> but uh, is that long term? Did you use the calibration? You put them from the ground and you calibrate them? Because I don't know a lot of people, so maybe now I know one. But, uh, I mean, that's something that maybe we should do. Uh, but, and so that came up also during the theme year. Uh, on water, right? Even if you calibrate, how do you calibrate? Is it consistent across the network? I mean, it's- Yeah, especially for the soil moisture, um, being able to do it well in a lab and then translate that to your field installation is really weird. And um, what we have done in the past is just take grab samples from the field for calibration. So that you know, we have a number from the sensor, we have a number from the samples we took. 
Yeah. We've had a similar discussion with not calibration, but with preventative maintenance on our towers, where we have to bring in the booms that are holding our 2D wind and radiation sensors. And so it's like, how often are we messing with the boom and bringing in and out that will maybe cause a problem? Uh, and so we've kind of like pushed back, like it's operating fine. <laughs> Um, it doesn't need, like, we don't have particularly um, dusty sites in some or other things that we would warrant the need to brush off the PAR sensor or something or an apogee. Um, and so we're kind of more in the camp of don't touch it, it's doing fine um, until we do a quarterly maintenance. So don't do preventative maintenance every other week or something like we're, we're maybe needing to do in other sites, but not so at ours. And so that discussion has come up. So uh, Jackson, I don't want to put you on the spot, but for you're saying not dusty, I thought Fresno was pretty dusty, but Elkhorn maybe because it's surrounded by ag system. I mean you might not have choices like you have to go clean up on a regular basis. And those might be short type of towers that you have. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, I mean our canopy is virtually like I don't know a foot max um, because of the wetland vegetation and we get a lot of like salt spray um and so i mean we're still kind of because the towers are fairly new in their first year of life we're kind of troubleshooting that um we found like um sprays that prevent like rusting and then our signal strength on all of the like the 77 and 7500 are always really bad when we get there we we maintenance it every couple of weeks but it ends up being more like every week <laughs> so um uh, we still haven't completely figured out ways to prevent that from happening yeah, yeah and, and that's so two things that's when the community engagement because we probably have sites in the arctic that deal with like in churchill i imagine the salts uh deposit on if you have a 77 on it must be Fun to deal with. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's why we're here, right? Let's talk to each other and see uh, this. Um, I'm gonna keep moving because so there's also self calibrating sensors that we could use, like we use this for solid flux plates. Right? Uh, they're a bit more expensive than the others. They require a bit more filtering for the flag when the. Um, I don't think the the proxy flux self calibrating are worth the money because they're like twelve hundred bucks or something. <laughs> we have some in Tondi that have been there for 12 years. Their self calibration value is the same number for the entire, entire 12 years. Wow. So, you know, <laughs> do I need to calibrate them? You said Tondi, right? So, because one of the things that might be, yeah, anyway, I don't, the, the site calibration, I don't remember <coughs> when we can. Uh, there, but one of the challenges for solid flux bed is uh, vegetation accumulation and the depth of the sensor change over time. Uh, how does that bias your calibration versus not bias your calibration? I don't know. I mean, that's all the issues. I know, yeah, that's not the, in the self calibration, it's just a heater on the plate. So you're only looking at the heat through the plate. So you aren't dealing with all those other problems of, of you know, the, the exposure, litter building up and change of position in the soil. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of other things that are more important than the calibration. Yeah. Okay, so we have plenty of other examples, so that's, that's, that's great. Um, one thing that we do, uh, but I don't know, uh, we always evaluate when we buy new sensors, uh, making sure that they meet the specs that the manufacturer said they should meet. I think especially it's getting more and more important as we see more issues with new sensors coming out of manufacturers. Uh, with, production speed ramping up and less QHC on their side. So that's an example that's a, a test that Stephen has conducted on a, a TGA 200 to measure N2O fluxes uh, from Campbell Scientific, where we, we, we do an environment test. So we flush uh, known concentration or fixed concentration doesn't need to be known uh, through uh, the cell to the system. And then we check uh, how the uh, average value change over time. And then we see the noise change over, over the Period of testing that we do right for this is uh, I don't know how many seconds, but a lot, well, but I don't know if it's a few hours uh, that we've done the test a few days, three um, hours, three hours, 10,000. Um, 
So you see that the analyzer on the lower right does X prime loops, right? And so that got us to think about, oh, what's the issue? Send us onto a wide goose chase, but eventually we, we address this issue. But that's something we do, right? We assess our instruments uh, uh, when we get our instruments. The cardiac calibration um, is also um, site dependent, like uh, we're saying. So some people do calibration in the field, some people do calibration in the lab, some people do calibration in the field for CO2, but not for water. Um, it's funny, I grabbed those pictures last night uh, for the calibration of the uh, open pass 75 on RS. Uh, although I believe uh, those systems should be calibrated upright, the pictures they show you on the website, they, they are all laying on their side. So uh, it's interesting. You know the reason for the upright? Because they're the same position in the field? Or? Something with the chopper motor. Yeah, that's what's. Uh, mm -hmm. so often, it's usually for us. Yeah, we call it great eyes. Well, I mean, the, so we, so you talk to Dave Johnson or to, I don't know, or Yeah, so. Did he tell you to do a two point calibration? He didn't have a strong opinion on that. I mean, their manual is like 50 on whether that's valuable, depending on the range of your ambient concentrations. So I put the link here on the calibration, uh, the light warm calibration procedures. Um, keep in mind, so. The take home message is we have, we provide calibration gases. So, as calibration gases, we put a lot of effort to make sure. So, those are the really good grade calibration standards, right? You could well, use this to do trace gas measurements at better than 0.1 ppm for CO2, better than half ppm for methane. And now we're doing N2O. Um, oh, that was online. Um, Cassandra, we are, now, we are now able to do. Isotope of CO2 also calibration, um, right. if you're interested. So uh, feel free to ask uh, about this. Well, I mean, that goes back to your point. You know, yes, use Ameriflex gases because it's really hard to get good gases. And um, in calibrating, you have to have something, a standard that you trust. That's right. And, and so, so you, you can calibrate with all sorts of things, and you know you, right. your calibration is only as good as your standard. So. So I think uh, it, that's something you should leverage. We are really using a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito here because <laughs> it only is really this for, but it's there, right? I mean, we leverage this across multiple projects. So it's a, uh, it's a service that we have. Uh, and then for water vapor calibration, if you don't have a, a water vapor generator from like home, we also have loaders for this, right? If you need to borrow one to do your calibration, Please ask, and then we we loan you a assessor. Okay. Maintenance calibration, right? You can calibrate the heck of what you want. If your sensor is dirty, out of luck. So that's the, the message of this, right? Uh, the keeping your sensor clean is the number one priority. Uh, because if you have sensors like you see on the uh, on the picture on the left, on the right. Um, yeah, that's not gonna help. Uh, as Joel mentioned, you're probably gonna put a calibration that's gonna not affect uh, your measurements. Uh, yeah, keep sensor dry. Um, and for uh, radiation sensors, leveling is the big issue, right? challenge. Uh, especially if you have long boom. I mean, you are saying if you have long boom, four meter long boom, and you have to bring it back, and you cannot see the level. And then if you introduce something bit of, we'll see. How soon will catch this? Like, oh, <laughs> when you do the dark <laughs> solution. <laughs> uh, but anyway, because well, you, I mean, yes, you catch it, right? So, um, we have put a best practice checklist on our website. Um, so you can grab the QR code, the URL to the PDF is there. It's really focusing on, guideline, right? It's not something you should do, but it's to help you to checklist uh, that focuses on preventive maintenance for weekly schedule, monthly schedule, semi-annually or annually schedule. And it's really ideas, right? That we, that's what you should check potentially. We're trying to be helpful, right? Uh, if you have comments also, ask, um, send us comments and say, oh, we're also doing this, that might be helpful. Really try to provide resources to the community. Uh, Almost at time, I think I'm.
Oh, and then there's manufacturer's recommendation, right? Uh, for uh, can machine table, we find for most uh, um, sensors two years uh, is a good interval uh, category. Um, and then for our guy, it's a bit different. It's based on environmental condition and your site, right? So you know better uh, than uh, what we do because your site is very unique. Okay, again, learner program. Um, we have learner program for uh, sonic animometers, power sensors. You might have heard that Mike uh, Kipenzolain is not making power sensors anymore. This is over. Who is? What? Who is not making? Uh, Kipenzolain. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's it. No more PQS1. Done. So we are shifting to Lyco 190R. Uh, but we have invested heavily. So we have a lot of those that we keep. Um, uh, in stock, and then we calibrate, we put on a virtual scale. So please continue to ask uh, for past sensors uh, learners. Um, we have data loggers, ergas. Um, we also have a uh, leaf area index sensors that we can loan to uh, sites that want to do some surveys uh, at their site, right? For leaf area index. Um, so metadata, it's always the key. How do you keep track of the calibration and maintenance activity that you do? It's absolutely key. And that's gonna come up in play when you submit data to a marriage club. So it's gonna come up in play for you when you analyze your data, and you write your papers, and you try to get a good consistent data set, but also when you share with the community. So um, feedback also, uh, when, where, what was done, what about instrumentation configuration that are different. Uh, it's not only configuration, it's also firmware for some of the Sonic that we use. Um, a lot of coefficients, parameters. Um, and if you start to have a site that runs for uh, 10, 15, 20 years, imagine the students in 20 years going back to your site if you have that documentation uh, or that complete documentation. It's going to make things different, difficult, right? And because we not all have to reprocess our data, but at some point we do have to do some uh, reprocessing. And I think I'm right on top of million uh, ten. Uh, thank you. Um, hopefully, it was interactive enough. I was hoping we could get more interactive, but uh, comments are online. Uh, I didn't follow. So there was new people that joined. Oh, new people joined. Okay. Uh, so 10, um, we have a coffee break for 15 minutes. Um, who joined online? I see. Yeah, I have your attention page. This is the monthly test of the public address system. Trust me. This is the monthly test of the public address system. Oh. Just checking for emergency for the post okay. John. What? What is the emergency radio holders or line the monthly radio check to begin momentarily? Thank you. This is all really useful information, particularly for somebody like me who's starting up. Um, I'm wondering about um, upgrades of instrumentation. You know, like if you're using an instrument from say 20 years ago and and you know, Lycor has something new, like 7200 versus 7000. That, you know, are the recommendations about you know when should you really consider retiring older equipment? That's that's working. <laughs> so same kind of if it's ink broke, don't fix it. Kind of approach. Or it's done a few more. We've got I mean, we've got several considerations. One of them is that we're running nine sites or something, and if we have we, in the past we've had different models of things, and then it was just really hard to keep everything organized because we had to keep track of where things were and who was using what. And so we have tried to standardize and we're still running a Lycor 7500, not even the RSDS, whatever thing we're on. Are, and have no plans to upgrade until we start losing enough of them that we're gonna have to be forced to move to the next step. Um, and again, you know, it's, every, all of these are site by site experiment by experiment things you have to figure out and you know if there's something new in the next iteration that's going to improve your measurements yeah by all means if you can afford it yeah, go to the next one i mean that's the other thing is you don't have money to upgrade all the 
time. So um, most of the measurements we make these days, I think, are pretty solid. This is the EOD, the building emergency radio test. Please listen to your call sign and respond to the contract. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the individual. Yeah, it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? I mean, it's, if you have seven sites, it's new sensors, is $25,000. It is a budget, right? $200,000 to cycle through. Um, so either you start doing once at a time, or, uh, but it's, it's a cost. If, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the 7,577, uh, I guess the 7,700 really came out in about 2012 and it wasn't popular for a few more years after that. So a lot of them were made around that time. Are there any like material advancements between then and now in terms of the models being produced or they're identical? I think they're, I, I'm not aware of massive yeah, technology so change. It hasn't changed yeah. too much. They mm -hmm. have had plans for a new model, but it's, I think COVID put it on hold. Mm -hmm. um, not that it necessarily needs to be upgraded. But. Yeah, the technology, I don't think it changed very much. I don't think the spray that they, you know, the, the cleaner, uh, that changed, uh, yeah. but I'm not aware of any major. We got some of the first ones, and then Jay's system got some of the newest ones, and they're exactly. Yeah. It's a minor thing. I think the radiation, radiation shield yeah. in earlier version is very short. One of the, yeah. 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 But that was basically within the first year. I'll just so. get back to the, the, the Question. Another thing to consider, we see this a lot in the data. So when you when you are considering transition to a new system, sometimes it's a good idea to have benchmarking for a period of time. So if you're switching from a closed test system to an open test or in closed system, it's a good idea to have them run side by side for a period of time for benchmarking. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of data drifting because people just switching a sensor and there's no way to go back to see which one is working better or not or how to. Yeah. Okay. Online, any comments? I don't want to stand between. There's new people. Should we go through a couple of new people that join, or <coughs> oh, we can go to coffee? Okay. Coffee. Okay. Let's do coffee. Uh, cookies, fruits, water, tea, coffee. Uh, Fifteen minutes. So ten twenty. Uh, the next call would be data transmission uh, options at remote sites. So, online people, yeah, uh, 15 minute break. We resume at uh, 10 20. I, I just left it back in that
It's not muted. So we're good. Okay. Great. Folks online can hear us. Recording in progress. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, we have one more uh, tech related discussion before we uh, hand over to the data team for the presentation uh, later this morning. Um, right now I'm going to give a short presentation about remote uh, or data transmission at our remote sites. Um, the photo in the background is the site that we'll be visiting for those of you who are here in person and are participating in the site visit. This is um, US RGF, um, just outside of Modesto. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the site um, later. Oops. All right, <clears throat> a little bit of background motivation about why we want to enable uh, remote data communication. Um, I and the rest of the data uh, tech team are really firm believers in having regular, repeated, and frequent review of your data is the best way to generate continuous and high quality observations. Um, as a data provider and operating websites, this is my number one goal. And really having a way to communicate with my site from my office is vital to that. Um, it also opens up a lot of opportunities for me to engage with my data. And you know, I just want to touch upon those here. Uh, first is just doing some remote troubleshooting and identifying issues promptly. I can be logged into my system and have, you know, um, a site technician or even the farmer at some of these sites go check a few things and I can see the response in real time. Um, we talked a little bit about engaging with the data, but every time I'm logging in, I'm learning more about my system, my instruments, and that makes me better at the job that I'm trying to do, just collect observations. Uh, certainly there's an opportunity for faster science, and this is great for, you know, whether that's capturing an emerging trend or trying to pair with some satellite observation, being able to grab your observations um, near real time is, can be really valuable. Um, and then lastly, something maybe we don't always think about, but some uh, site security, you know, we have a lot of there's cameras, you know, we have doorbell cameras, things like that. There's no reason you couldn't integrate something like this into um, a flex site just to see who's coming and going, whether that's human or animals or others. Uh, <coughs> So there's a lot of ways to enable data transmission at a remote site. It's well beyond the scope of this talk to go into a deep dive of all of those, but you know, here in the cartoon, kind of summarize three broad categories. The first is kind of the most manual. You're going to a site, you're pulling a data card, you're using a thumb drive, or you're connecting a laptop to your data logger and you're grabbing data. Uh, the second option is kind of a direct connection um, through some kind of telecommunication telecommunication cable, um, whether that's fiber optics or you know, phone lines. And then the last is uh, kind of an over the air data transmission. So whether that's using a cell phone network, um, satellite communication, a radio link. Um, and it's not to say that any one of these can't be used uh, in, in tandem with another option. Um, as we go through these different options and talk about some of the pros and cons, I think there's 
I can think of five big categories of considerations that you may want to think about when either upgrading or installing um, one of these options for communications. Uh, first is just data, uh, data transfer. How much, how frequent, what are bandwidth available, um, and also what are the limits uh, if you're working with a data provider, if they have caps on you know, daily amounts or weekly amounts or versus some, some period. Um, of course, we're always thinking about how expensive these things are. Um, not only the upfront one time like hardware costs or infrastructure costs if you're setting up radio repeaters, um, but also things like recurrent costs for data plans um, for you know, a cell, cell modem or a satellite connection. Um, the realities of how most of us consume or interact with the internet, we're consuming data and we're downloading, 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 streaming stuff. Really, a lot of these networks are meant for that one-way transport, but at our flux sites, we're doing the opposite. Our towers are collecting the information, and we're asking that we want that information back to the cloud or to our desks. Um, so there's a really big, um, typically a very asymmetric balance in terms of upload and download speed, so it's something to think about. We're trying to upload information, and there can be an order of magnitude difference between what we get download versus upload. Um, you know, we're always thinking about reliability of our systems and uptime, um, and you know, it's something you want to think about for your data communications as well. And then, lastly, you know, resources. I'm thinking about this from the human aspect. Um, not only staff time, but also just whether you know knowledge and capabilities are there, or whether you need to like contract that out or work with others. Um, before moving on, I also want to just plug. You know, something Sebastian mentioned is we want to hear from you guys. We're going to have opportunities to interact with if you've got questions or if you've got an anecdote that you want to share please raise your hand or speak up if you're online we're, we've got the chat open um please chime in so here's just a very simple cartoon schematic highly generalized but kind of just putting some of these options on two different axes of complexity and transfer speeds but as we saw in the previous slide you know you could use a whole different, a whole lot of other axes to you know make your decisions about pros and cons of each of these, you know whether it's the manual, a hardwired network, or something over the air. Um, and again, some of these could be used in tandem. You could have multiple different options. You know, one for moving high frequency data, one for moving you know uh, lower volume half hour summaries, things like that. Um, All right, uh, a quick word just about data volumes. Um, I think it's important to have a realistic understanding of how much data your site may be collecting and how much you want to move. Um, data plans can certainly add up, and the more data you're trying to move, the more expensive those plans are. Uh, so here's you know, a few examples. The first is just some data, 20 columns. You're saving it as four byte floating point values. If you wanted to move, a day of 10 hertz for your high frequency observations, you know, my calculation, something about 70 megabytes. But of course, you could change this math really quickly. If you're collecting 20 hertz observations, you're doubling that. Or if you want to save this as you know a two-byte floating point, you'd cut that in half. Um, but just doing the math up front and thinking about that. Versus if you're just trying to send, you know, 30-minute averages um, a whole day, you know, this is four orders of magnitude smaller. This you can accomplish. Uh, with you know much smaller data packets and a much cheaper data plan. Um, another example is just PhenoCam image. These are at a lot of Ameriflux sites, certainly not all of them, but they're just phenological camera. Our camera is taking imagery for phenological um, studies. Um, a lot of these I see come out to about 400 kilobytes an image. If you're doing two an hour, two different bands visible in infrared over the daylight hours, you know, you'd be looking at uh, 25 megabytes. And then something that may be more relatable is just thinking about you know, streaming video, uh, say YouTube, just standard standard quality video, you know, a 30 minute video, you'd be looking at 300 megabytes. So just putting that in perspective, um, Sebastian's already plugged the Ameriflux YouTube channel, but I'll plug it here again. There's a lot of great pre-recorded content. You can watch it at double the speed so you can save yourself time <laughs> about Ameriflux or other things that you're gonna get here again today. Um, 
This talk will also be on the YouTube channel after you go home. Um, all right, so everyone's favorite. We're going to jump back into Jamboard. I want to hear and ask everyone to participate in another Jamboard. This one is, I want to hear from you about your biggest challenges for remote communications. Um, I learned from our previous, someone should place this. Let me put this in the chat. Um, okay, it's in the chat. Um, if anyone needs the QR code, take it quickly. Otherwise, I'm going to switch over. So uh, I learned from our morning example. I put the background as an image so you can't move the background. So <laughs> don't try because you can't do it. Um, <laughs> So same thing, you can just add a sticky note here on the side and type in your um, type in your biggest challenge. And then I've put three different uh, boxes. You can move your sticky note around to one of, whether it's a knowledge-based challenge, a resource-related challenge, or something else. Um, So I see one that says security when opening ports to the public. Um, site security is a very important consideration. I will talk about that a little bit, but if um, someone has a specific anecdote about site security and opening ports, uh, you're welcome to chime in. Trying to read this one, it says, have you ever actually yeah. Lack of software network security knowledge, particular for Wi Fi connections. Great. Touching on the security, it wasn't me that put that, but one time I did have a ransomware attack at one of my remote sites. I had to? Yeah. What, what did you do? Or what happened? Well, fortunately, so we had the data on a 7550. We had the like, thumb drive that was still on it, but so we had just transferred, we actually had just been to the site like a month before. So there was data which had been on the computer um, in a file labeled data, and then all of that was encrypted. And it was like, okay, well, fortunately we had uh, actually a remote communication link between the 7550 and our, you're running a, like a bare bone computer setup at the site. So we just transferred the data from the 7550 which was unencrypted back onto the computer. So we actually didn't lose any data. We just kind of like, we didn't, then we changed the IP um, of what it was. Cause it was like a pretty basic, like 192.168.0.100 or something pretty basic. And then I think it was like a, I think the port forward we left as the default, which is I think 3389. I don't know. Um, so we changed the port forward for, yeah, for remote desktop, correct. So, but I don't really know how they got into it, but it was a kind of back of the calculation. We just fixed it, swapped the IP, and then we offloaded data from 7550 back onto the computer. So we actually didn't lose anything. Did you need to replace that bare bone computer? Yeah. Then? We didn't replace it. Oh. Didn't replace it. So what that encrypt, you said the thumb drive got encrypted or? No, the actual, I don't, I think it was just the data on the computer itself. Mm -hmm. So the thumb drive, which was on the 7550 was fine, totally fine. Yeah. That's lucky. Uh, yeah. yeah. We had a full, Picaro is those pretty expensive gas uh, yeah. and, and they run Windows. They run Windows, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so we see behind the firewall. Uh, but it's a work in collaboration with Noah. The person in charge of the firewall that disabled the firewall, the entire system got hacked, encrypted, and messed up with the KVD temperature control and ruled the sensor. Wow. So it was a pretty expensive and mm. oh. Yeah, because they didn't get into like the link between the computer and the 7550. It was just that. Okay. We were like, yeah, because all the data on the 7550 was totally unencrypted. Well, Still the GHG I mean, files. Yeah, you know, part of it is that you know the, the operating system that the 
seventy-five fifty is running is pretty fair. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Whereas, again, Picaro is running Windows. So. Yeah, I don't think they knew like oh Win SCP. I yeah. have to you know <laughs> type in this specific thing. So yeah. Look Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you for sharing that anecdote. It's uh, something we'll talk about for yeah. site security. Um, but uh, just jumping back to the Jamboard, looks like we're uh, reaching up oh, still a few things, but we're seeing a lot of other security issues, uh, also uptime, um, whether that's related to network providers, um, but also frozen antenna. I, I believe that's probably going to cause downtime. Um, they're certainly in the top, the green box, the knowledge base. There's certainly a lot of folks who have chimed in with just lock, lack of security knowledge, Wi-Fi settings, IP settings, network settings. Um, so these are all great, and I oh sorry, I appreciate everyone who's uh, chimed in. I'm gonna, I'm going to keep moving um, in the interest of time, but uh, this will remain open if you have other things you want to add. Let's, let's jump back. Great, so <clears throat> what I would like to do is run through two examples. Um, the first is gonna be around cell, mode, cell modem configuration. Um, and then I was gonna hand it off to my colleague Sigurd to talk about satellite communication. But she's not here, so I'm gonna to try to stumble through that example. But first um, is an example on cell modem. So this is from our Rice and Grit site. So there are six sites that um, we're operating in agricultural system. So I wouldn't call these like really remote, but they're, I would say they're more rural. So we have, there is cell, cell towers nearby. And so, you know, using a cell modem that's shown here, this little black box is a really good, great way for us to piggyback off of existing infrastructure. I don't have to build anything. You know, we all have our cell phones. We're all interacting with the internet all the time. So cell modems are just, you know, basically a cell phone in your flux tower. Um, I'm going to use this as an example to walk through some of how I interact with the site and the data, but also um, how I set up and some of the network configurations that was certainly brought up in the Jamboard about settings and IP configurations and things like that. Um, for those of you who are curious about putting cell phone modems at your tower, I will say that most of the major carriers, certainly here in the US, I, I assume uh, more broadly as well, have really good maps of coverage for their networks. There's also a lot of third party websites where you can actually like identify the location of towers and their uh, and the network provider. So if you need to set up like a directional antenna, you can find these maps and you can look up where the nearest towers are and build and try to um, strengthen your, your network connection. Because I've been to a lot of Ameriflux sites where you know you might get half a bar if you're lucky and you know um, the difference between one bar and two bars can really make a big difference when you're trying to move um, high frequency data. Um, so yeah, moving through this example. So this is our site. We're doing greenhouse gas emissions over agriculture. So we've got 7,700, um, uh, 7,500 back there. And then this uh, trace gas analyzer measuring N2O fluxes. Um, a few examples. So first, you know, having a remote connection allows me to call in and talk to any of my network connected devices. So again, 7,500, 7,700 methane sensor, the trace gas analyzer, my data logger, my cell modem, the camera. Um, I can log into those sensors and do everything I could as if I was on site. So here on the left showing, you know, my connection. So the data logger using LoggerNet, I can see all the values in real time. I can send a new program. I can reset the clock. I can download data. Um, the example on the right is from one of the gas analyzers. This is for the 7700, the methane sensor. Again, I can see data. I can turn on the washer. I can turn on the uh, spinner. I can change settings. Um, I can look at the laser, whether it's locked, all sorts of things. It's really valuable to do you know, troubleshooting or make changes in real time. For other sensors, just putting them on the internet enables them to do what they're trying to do, which is upload data. There are some sensors that are connected to cloud 
search cloud data services. And so I just need to plug them into the internet, give them the internet, and they're going to do their own thing. This is great. Um, one example is the PhenoCam network. So these are just cameras that are taking imagery and sending them out to um, FTP cloud server. And so I put them on the internet and they're doing their own thing. Um, another example are these um, air quality sensors uh, that are measure measuring particulate matter concentration that is part of the purple air network. These became really popular during some of the wildfire episodes we had in California and in the West Coast broadly. Um, these are also on a cloud server, so they just need to be put on the internet and they're sending out data automatically. But of course, we're a flux network and what we really are really want to know and want to see is our eddy covariance fluxes. And, but as you know, collecting high frequency um, observations of wind, wind speed and gas concentrations, they're still a very big step. That's the eddy covariance processing. You get 30 minute fluxes. So there's two ways you can really do this. Um, one is you can have all those eddy covariance processing happen at the site. And then you just need to move up your half hour fluxes to um, some, some server so you, can, so you can get that data. Or the other approach is to ship all your high frequency data to a server, have it processed and visualized. So two different, two different ways to do it. Uh, I'm gonna show an example here on the right showing uh, a Litecore product called Flux Suite. It integrates with their Smart Flux, which is a little processing unit that, have, that is at the site. Um, if you have Flux Suite, you can log in it's downloading all the half hour fluxes from smart flux, but also all the diagnostics and all the input uh, from, from your sensors. And so you, know, you can go to their graphical user interface, which is you know, web-based and see fluxes of you know, CO2 and latent heat. Um, the example on the left is from um, our sites from the Rice and Grids project. And you know, so we do the other approach. We are shipping out all the high frequency data Every day, we're having um, all that process automatically on a data server and, and visualized. So, you know, I can, you know, here's an example of a week of fluxes for CO2, uh, latent heat, and sensible heat, and momentum. Um, we have this all on a giant master uh, website that shows all of our sites going across in real time, not in real time, but about a day delay, all of our sites reporting data um, for just hundreds and hundreds of variables, um, all available from all our sites. So that's one other way, you know, that's what's really most powerful for us is to be able to get our high frequency data out and process and visualize so we can see what's happening um, at our fields. All right. Um, certainly in the Jamboard, I saw some questions about network infrastructure and IP addresses and confusion there. So here's a slide. There's a lot going on. I will try to just highlight a few, few items. Um, for me, when I'm setting up network configurations, drawing it out is really helpful for me. And here's my conceptual diagram of hypothetical network. Your cell modem here in the middle is kind of your gateway between the outside world and your local network. So everything over here is your local network, your LAN. And everything inside your local network is going to have a local IP address. I'm a big proponent that you know you, the network designer, should assign those IP addresses to each of your components, whether it's a Picaro, a gas analyzer, your camera, your data logger. That way, you have control over the network and avoid conflicts. Um, of course, from the outside, your 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 station is going to have a single IP address. And so thinking about how you can reach each of these components separately, um, there's this idea of uh, port assignment. So you can assign each device a port so that when traffic is coming in, it knows that's how you uh, reach a specific device through a port. Um, I'll also emphasize that any one device can have multiple port assignments for maybe different communication protocols like a data logger can have a port open for FTP data transfer or also one for LoggerNet. Um, and so, you know, I, I think drawing it out and mapping out your network can be a really powerful way when you're building these and trying to um, design your network 
can be helpful. Uh, so this was already brought up a little bit, but uh, network security is a bigger, bigger concern. Um, in my opinion, you should do everything you can to stop unwanted guests on your network. Uh, we heard one example already, um, or two examples. Um, I've seen this on a number of systems and it's, it can be a real nightmare to, um, to fix. Um, so do everything you can upfront to minimize unwanted visitors. So first and foremost, change, don't use default passwords. I mean, it, it sounds pretty obvious, but it's amazing how many devices are still shipping with like very basic, like one, two, three, four, five passwords. Um, so change them uh, to something strong. Um, especially for cell modems, but probably for other network devices, um, upgrade their firmware often. Um, the firmware often captures security, known security vulnerabilities. Uh, I will also add that I think some of the firmware updates really have market performance increases or improvements. So I've seen cell modems that have a lot of downtime, but you upgrade the firmware and it can really improve the performance. So um, keeping track of the cell modem firmware, uh, I would encourage. Um, another step is to restrict access to your devices. Um, so blocking IP ranges, blocking closing ports, doing everything you can just to leave what you need open and, and nothing more. Um, for, for all of our sites, I've restricted the IP range to only things that originate from here at Berkeley Lab. Everything else will get blocked. So I can tell you the IP address, but you'll have no way to get in because unless you're calling in from, um, from Berkeley Lab. And then lastly, you know, if, you, if your local network has also a Wi-Fi uh, capability, thinking about the same things for the Wi-Fi part of your network, because someone driving by, if they can get in on the Wi-Fi network, they have access to your local network as well. All right, um, second example, and this is something that I do not know very well. I was hoping Sigrid would be here. She's coming back from Alaska, where she, I think she was working on these systems. Um, so Sigrid is operating, is part of the tech team, and is operating some sites in um, the Seward Peninsula in Alaska. These are US NGC. Um, this example is from US NGC, and they have a very complicated data communication path. So you can see her tower is this um, yellow dot, and then it's sending via a Wi-Fi link to um, a repeater at the top of, well, it's called Rocky Top, it's the, a ridge, ridge line um, repeater station. And then from there, it sends to another station, and then um, that's their access point to a satellite link, which is shipping the data out to um, servers at Berkeley Lab in Oak Ridge. Um, so it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of infrastructure. If you can see the photos, you can see the repeaters up here. You can see it at her station. Um, I can't speak too uh, in, in much more detail about this, but maybe um, if you have questions when Sigurd arrives, you can certainly um, talk to her about this. And this is another slide is just about how she interacts with various aspects. She has both desktop and mobile access. Um, the mobile access is pretty pretty cool using um, some of the tools that uh, Camel Scientific provides for her to reach her data loggers um, any, anywhere from her phone. Um, and just on the topic of satellite communication, I think this is, you know, for a lot of sites where there's no cell, cell towers, uh, satellite communication can be a really great, great way to make a link to your site. Um, there's more and more satellites going up. The costs are coming down tremendously. Um, I jumped on two websites looking at satellite costs. So in in this example, um, they're using sorry, they're using QsNet. Uh, QsNet has data plants on their website. They're advertised for less than a hundred dollars a month. Oh, amazing. Um, Starlink is also growing rapidly in the U.S. Um, I think some of the Starlink, Starlink plans can start 
around $250 a month. So those are options for really, really remote sites. Um, all right, one more. Um, I want to hear your tips for remote communication. So we talked about challenges previously. So now um, I want to get your tips and I will post this in the chat as well. Oh, sorry, let me go back to the chat. All right, now it's in the chat. Great, so same thing if you want to add a sticky note and talk about some of your experiences uh, or tips that you found helpful for building out your remote communication networks. So that's a great tip. Someone wrote in uh, having redundancy. So in this, in their specific case, having satellite and radio. So I, I absolutely agree. Having mul multiple options if it's available is a great way to do it. Someone wrote in describing a radio link to existing infrastructure, i.e. a research station, um, can provide a link with fewer restrictions on data transfer. Uh, if this person would like to say more about this, I'm very yeah. curious. About that, well, that was me. So, great. so in Churchill, what we ended up doing is satellite is an option, but it's expensive and it's often slow and has restrictions on how many megabytes per month we can upload. But we have a research station that we contract with that's about, I think in this case, it's maybe like eight miles away. Um, so we use a 900 megahertz radio link there. And so then working with their IT folks, you know, we opened up a few ports and we have public IPs assigned to our instruments. And then, you know, we're transferring 10 hertz data daily in a matter of like an hour or two. And that research station, they have like hardwired internet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. What was your? Could you share your experience with if you were involved with setting up the radio link, the 900 megahertz? Um, it was fairly simple. You use a freeway. Um, FG, FPG, two or something like that. Um, so it's it came somewhat configured from freeway, but it was essentially we just gave the gateway an endpoint uh, ID so that they knew to recognize each other. And then, you know, it's just a matter of setting up the Yagi antennas and they were pointing in the right direction. And it worked great, pretty much right out of the box. But and, yeah, yeah. Um, but also previously we've used uh, the ubiquities have been pretty good in the Arctic and they mm -hmm. tend to yeah. uh, tolerate the low temperatures. So do you want to talk a little bit about interference? Maybe? Yes. Uh, so Sebastian brought up something about interference, and this is something I guess we recently ran into at a site where uh, there were reports of another instrument having seeing noise and they were asking about 900 megahertz devices and my ears cracked up because we have some 900 
uh, megahertz radios to talk to some remote data loggers to, to our base station. And this is something I never thought about when setting it up because there's a, I think it's a microwave radiometer that operates at 900 megahertz. And we've got our data radios at 900 megahertz. This causes problems. So just being aware of any issues with you know um, RF and, and other frequencies, other whether it's instruments or um, other things, could be important. Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, someone wrote uh, Campbell purchase modems are generally easier to set up than dealing with AT and T and Verizon. Um, I, I would love to hear this person's perspective or experience. That was me. Great. <clears throat> I've spoken on the phone too often with AT&T and Verizon trying to get static IP addresses for cell phones. Some of them don't even know what I'm talking about, what the device is. Um, you know, you often dealing with uh, the business line or the, you know, residential line folks and customer service. And I think Campbell recognized that and that's why they started this other you know, connect system that they have and just purchase the modem directly from them. They handle all the communication side. It just seems a lot simpler than what I've dealt with before. And are you able to get static IP address from Camel directly? Okay. So is your, you have a data plan through Camel then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it makes sure it a lot know. simpler because they, yeah. they, they basically take out the middleman when it comes to at and Verizon, it's just, yeah, or T-Mobile, could be any of those telecommunication companies. It's the biggest headache in the world. <laughs> I will say that from my experience, I'm very fortunate to be here at a large institution, so we have a whole IT or telecommunications person, so I'm interacting with that person here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have to call Verizon or at and <laughs> They give me a SIM card that has static IT. <laughs> Perfect. That's why I wanted to ask because this is this is the real world, yeah. not you know, not all these resources. Right. Right. Uh, great. Um, thanks everyone for sharing your tips, and I think we will keep trucking. It looks like this is slowing down. Um, So that's pretty much all I really wanted to present for remote communication. We're also pretty much on, right on time. So I want to leave you with a few final thoughts. Um, you know, we, we at the tech team see ourselves as a resource for the community. So we're also always looking for better ways to assist the American community. So if you've got ideas for how we can help assist in either improving or uh, establishing remote communications for your site, please reach out to us. Um, if you have other, if you have ideas for resources that you think would be helpful, let us know. Um, also, if you've done something really cool, really unique, or maybe even not just medium cool, and you want to share it on our blog, <laughs> we would love to put this out there because we think the community is stronger as a whole, and so other sites can learn from um, what you've done. Uh, reach out to us or write it up, send it to us, and we'll post it on the Ameriflux webpage. Um, as always, you know, you can reach us here. Um, and then lastly, just drive home this point, you know, keep eyes on your data. Uh, remote communication is one way to do that, but there's lots of others. So uh, thanks for your participation. Let's see, next we have self-review QAQC. I think how soon? Yeah. We need power. So we're switching a little bit. So what we've talked about up to now is collecting data, getting your data high quality, um, what you can do for maintenance for. Now we're switching. You have collected the best data in the world. <laughs> and now you're submitting it to a marriage flux and it goes through the the so format first with Danielle, and then after that, we send it to Hassan who does the QAQC. Right so I think that's what it's just like that. Okay. So, Danielle, you're up.
go to slideshow. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to turn on this camera. Because you're sharing to it. Okay, you're off. Just stand back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a lot of moving pieces. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, good to see everyone in face, uh, in, in, your, in your real person. And uh, I'm Hausen from the data team for now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a little bit, I changed the title a little bit because I realized uh, a lot of people, we have a lot of new. Uh, person in this workshop and starting the process about getting familiar with the Ameriflux data pipeline. So I think it's a good idea uh, to spend some time talking about the, uh, we call data life cycle or maybe from end to end. You'll see some uh, definition about what, what I mean by end to end. And yes, we'll talk a little bit about QQC, the, the most favorite topic people want to talk about that, I believe. No? I'll uh, just start with, all right, it's not moving. Yes, uh, start with a, a beautiful map of Ameriflux site and also the uh, many photos of the site. Uh, you can see they're very beautiful and also very diverse. Uh, let's take home here. They are very different sites. I mean, I believe you have a couple, many photos from your site too. And you can see a diversity of the site we're talking about. Depends on the ecosystem, the tower type, Instrumentation you're running, or even the processing and all the uh, hard work getting to the get the red data ready. And there's some number of other sites we are running today, right? So, most important part is there are uh, a couple hundred of the sites collecting the data uh, everywhere. And they try to, everyone try to work on their data. And uh, essentially, uh, the data will be submitted to Ameriflux, and potentially at some point, we make available to a lot of data users. So hundreds of sites, thousands of the, uh, to maybe 10,000 of the data users everywhere. So we're talking, talking about a lot of data movement, um, how we can facilitate this process. There's an end-to-end -end we're talking about, right? So starting from your site and all the way to the data user want to download data and have play with the data. So in order to facilitate this process, we, in the last couple of years, uh, the team uh, here it's been working how try to build what we call a pipeline, try to facilitate this process. Okay, starting with you or maybe someone from your lab collecting the data at the field, the green one. And there's some magic happened and uh, uh, people here involved, a Merfax magic project, people involved. Essentially, this data will be available to a data user uh, happily enjoying playing this data. <laughs> and, there are a couple of things here, right? So uh, um, in the earlier section, we talked about the uh, site maintenance data calibration and also how to transmit your data from your sensor all the way to your lab. And you do some magic about processing your data. And essentially, there will be some data ready available to be uploaded to Merflux. We call FluxMap data file. You have certain QQC done at your site. As usual, it's half hour to hour data interval. And you probably need to prepare this in a standard format. We'll talk uh, in just in a minute. And then you submit the data. And by the end, hopefully, this data will be available on what we call base data product. So, this is kind of the first uh, kind of the version we're putting uh, for most of the site. This is kind of the, they are provided as uh, just what you submitted. We just do a very general QQC, make sure data meet the quality standard, and before we can pull out. For the data user, they're in a standard format, so that means all the variable name, uh, the, their unit, and their um, a lot of format they're standardized, so user don't have to juggle too much about how to understand your uh, data. I won't talk too much about that, but we do have another version. It's been all further process based on the base data product. It's called FluxNet product. Uh, Jaberta will cover that tomorrow, and they'll be adding uh, some more variable to the data product and you collect it at your site. So what happened if, within this, this? This is a pipeline we're talking about. The green one is you submit your data. We can, we'll talk about a little bit about this, how you prepare your data. Then the data will bring through a couple step people module we're talking about, right? So first goes through the format QQC, checking uh, the 
your file is in a standard format, make sure we can understand your data. And then to a data QQC, it will be more like a, the data quality of your data that essentially you prepare the data for publication and make available on the Netflix website. All right, we will go through each of one, just in a second. Just give you an idea, you, if you haven't been through the process, uh, this is roughly the time uh, take, uh, needed to go through each of them. And it depend, depends on the situation. So it might, might, might be longer or shorter, depends on your situation. Format QQC, it happened almost automatically. So once you upload the data, you should see the email a report pretty soon. I mean, in, in, I don't know, minutes or maybe an hour, depends on the size of your file. And you can work on your file if you need it. If you have to correct something, you can work on your file, take maybe one or two days, and you can resubmit this and be so pipeline. And if the file is okay and ready for data QQC, we run a data QQC. And typically, I think there are some variation. We can talk about that later, but typically we run this every one or two months and we do this in batch. So means we pile every uh, ready submission in a batch and we review it. By we, I mean I review them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I probably compile that into a summarized report to you. We have some other process I uh, just started last fall. I'll talk that a little bit, uh, just for your reference. And this process could take, uh, depends on this, uh, the issue, I mean, identify issue of your site and also how familiar you are with this process. It could take one, two months, or depends. Sometimes it could be longer. And to fix the issue and bounce through again, and eventually everything works out and will be ready to publish your uh, data in our website. So this is a workflow. I'm going to talk each one of them in the next couple of uh, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. And we'll come back about the QQC. Everything I talked here will be available on the website. We, uh, we up, update our website last year. So a lot of information I'm talking today will be available there or you know where to find it. We are using, let's try another technique. Um, I'm using pull EV, uh, pull everywhere uh, to do the induction part. This is first started. So if you have a cell phone or if you grab a link, could someone put a link in the chat? Okay. Yeah, use a link or you, I don't have a QR code here. Go to this link and you should be able to Yes, okay. All right, everything. So the first question would be, which part of the data pipeline would you like to know more about? I hope we can have some. Okay, everyone have access to the pool. Great, uh, we have a lot of interest in the data QQC as part. Also some people are just starting to prepare the data for submission. So make sure we'll cover that. Stable now, okay. Well, next will be an open question. So I, I want to gather some interest about what people want to take from this one hour, right? We're talking about from end to end, from you submit the data all the way to when people download the data. So if you have anything, <laughs> A, okay. Um, <laughs> up here, up here. If you have anything you want to hear, make sure you want to uh, take from this section, just let me know. I've, try to cover that in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Or if I can now, I think some of our team should cover that today or tomorrow. Anything? People still typing. All right.
Okay. Uh, for gap feeding tomorrow, I'm going to point out to Gilberto in the room. So there's another, maybe Gilberto can answer this question tomorrow about a gap feeding for flux net one block processing. Uh, Prefer that for, for QQC in real near real time. Uh, something we'll, we maybe tomorrow morning we have a section so site people can talk about their um, how they operate their site during the QQC at their, in the preferred way. So maybe that's a good timing for this discussion tomorrow morning. Pipeline faster. Uh, let's try to talk about this now. Okay. Citation. I'll make sure I cover this. Data metric, uh, anyone want to leverage it about what this mean? Process data. Okay, this is another question for one flux processing tomorrow. Another citation, okay. Data metric. Okay, I'll keep this open so you can still type in. And maybe you can we can try to come back on this and try to answer some of the question later today, either in this section or another one. But let's move on. Uh, I know there are some people here in the room uh, just getting the process, starting the process about preparing your data. So I'll try to cover that a little bit but not too into a detail. So if you've done this so many times, just stay with me for five minutes. Uh, one thing about submission is, yes, we do require standard format when you submit the data. Uh, I, I'm going to list some of the uh, format guidelines here, but not all the detail. Uh, this is ASCII file format CSV. Uh, you can see the example here, a one line header. header. Uh, we have a standard list of the variable so you can find that on our website. So what it, the variable should call uh, their unit, the sign convention, then we have a definition for all of them. So make sure you use those. You don't have to provide a separate line of that unit. One thing to pay attention is you can either submit everything, I mean, all the year uh, in single file, or you prefer uh, manage your file in a separate year, you can do that too. So you can just by year, uh, just, Put all the variable, I mean, uh, put all variable in single file. That's what I mean. Um, if you have, a, for example, some people manage their file by flux variable, map variable at the same time, put that in the single file. You can separate out, separate out by time period, but don't separate out by column. Um, it's something we, we haven't, we won't be able to support. Um, another thing to think about it time keeping. This is the most uh, confusing part of flux. And data for, for a lot of time, people are using the preferred way to do their timekeeping. Um, we do use uh, a standard ISO time format. So the example here will be year, month, day, all the way to hour, minute. Um, and also to avoid confusion, um, we ask you to provide both starting time and also ending time. So there's no confusion about where this data got collected. Use local standard time, so no daylight saving uh, for sure. Uh, another, a couple of things, right? I mentioned this, uh, we use standard variable name, unique site convention, and also a missing value here. Uh, something about processing QQC your data, uh, we ask you, uh, because of the, the legacy of the map flux, so people have different way of uh, QQC their data. So we don't, we don't require the standard quality control or pre uh, processing step for, for your site. Try to do your best, filter your data as much as possible. Uh, we don't do any data cleaning here at this day. So that means clean your data as much as possible. I mentioned a couple of things you can consider here. Uh, 
It could be sensor diagnostic signal, could be a possible range of your variable, or could be some uh, statistic test you're running on the side uh, of your data, or sometimes using QQC flag, uh, like a focus flag, or something like that could be useful. One thing don't do is don't use star filter your flux variable. We are going to do that in a further one flux processing step. Okay. You can provide both uh, get field and non get field variable in a single file, which is a different file uh, variable name. That's a question. You don't want us to use star the data? You don't no. use star filter? You guys do the use star filtering? Yes. So we'll do the use star filtering in, in the further step in the one flux processing when we generate a flux net product. So we'll do that. So yes, if you are downloading the base data set, they are not used star filter. They shouldn't be. One exception is because you can provide a get field version of the flux variable, right? So that part you can you can use star filter and get field whatever you want and provide that as a way. Yes, Robert. Um, so the U star filter is the only one that we, we shouldn't apply at this step because you mentioned that you don't do any data cleaning. So anything for wind direction or signal strength or anything like that, we should do before submission, right? Yes, most of them. For you, for wind, wind direction filter, we do offer uh, one variable, I think it's batch. Um, I don't remember. I think there's one variable is uh, along with the batch or uh, wind direction QC flag. You can use that as a way to. If you don't want to filter our errors, you can you can I, use that. Yeah, it's part of our code. I'm just thinking because we have really aggressive wind direction filtering in one of our sites. And so I yeah, I know sure that yeah. it was part of the data. So um, two way, right? If you you can if you prefer, you can just filter everything out so the user can just download whatever they should be using. That's one way. Another yeah. way would be I mean that's some site. Some site have a, a, a little bit uh, mix of the uh, link cover type in their footprint. So sometimes they prefer to have a, a, another QC flag along with the fetch, uh, the footprint of the information. So it's another way to do it. We can talk about that if you have an interest about that. Sure. Okay, moving along. Uh, some, just a few slides about the data variable naming. Um, it's, the structure is like this, right? We have a, a, a name here. Uh, it's about the physical or or biological property of your variable. And we have a, a, a qualifier. So qualifier is a way to specify is this variable being get field or not? And also sometimes we use this for position, right? So if you have multiple things, I'm going to show you some example. Like a soil temperature, you have 30 soil temperature, and how do you submit that in a single file? So use a qualifier as a way to specify which variable uh, are there. Are there a single sensor variable? Are they aggregated or are they just, um, I don't know, average over the layer of the soil? That's another thing. Uh, just a couple examples about the variable. We support uh, more than 100 variables that can be submitted to us. I think 140 of them. Uh, don't be panicked. You don't have to submit 100 of them. <laughs> you don't have them. Uh, starting with the most common one, I think there's 30 to 50 common variable people submitting. And I, putting a histogram here. So this is based on what we see across the entire database, right? There are certain variable people tend to submit, flux variable for sure. There are some variable like radiation, temperature, humidity, um, wind direction, and maybe some soil information, temperature, moisture, um, four component radiation. I think these are the typical variable people submitted. So consider starting with those first and walk your way out to some other additional variable, okay? But I just want to mention, we do support a lot of the variable you collect at the side. If you have something on your mind, you very fancy new variable you're collecting and not on the list, just talk to me. I'll be happy to add them to a list. Qualifier, I won't talk into detail. This is just give you an idea uh, about how and how we support a different position, different uh, aggregation in a single file. So this is kind of your tower, right? And you might have just one eddy current system, but you have a profile of temperature and you have radiation, you have something going on in the soil, maybe a couple of different vertical profile and everything can be specified by this qualifier, right? So everything from a single sensor can be assigned with a one qualifier, one, one, one. Uh, maybe sometimes you 
you have an aggregate, right? So something like this could be supported. They are average from two sensors, so that you can specify your variable by this way. Or like a soil temperature, you have multiple location and you just want to submit the average one, you can submit that in this way. I won't go into the detail about this one, but if you have a question about the position qualifier and how to use them, just talk to me or Daniel. With that, we'll be happy to walk you through. All right, you have your file ready and you are ready to click the, 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 the link and submit your data. First thing you'll see is the format QQC we mentioned. You could probably get uh, uh, email very quickly um, once you submit a file. Behind the thing, this is what happened. So we have a, uh, once you submit your file, uh, we will run a QQC test to see if your file uh, um, uh, meet the requirement of the, the format and could be passed or maybe with some issue a return warning or fail this is the status and we will try to do auto auto correction for once and this is just try to deal with some of the minor issues we see a lot so um including for example like a file name renaming or maybe uh, you're missing one time step uh, in your file uh, we probably can correct that just minor issue and once we do the auto correct we we'll run the file, the auto corrected file, through the format QQC QQ again and see if the file uh, passed or failed. The end result will be here. So uh, we, everything is okay, you just pass and we'll queue the file for QQC at some point, or maybe there's some warning. You'll see an email, I'm going to show you some example. And you'll probably see a, a warning on your uh, format QQC report. You probably want to take a look a little bit to see whether I'm not missing anything or you misinterpret your file. And if there's something we just cannot deal with, you probably see a fail in the email, don't be panicked. Uh, just, uh, just we, we, we are in there. Um, just take a moment and look at your file and see what happened. Maybe do some action about that. This is a, uh, the email you see, right? In the, the header, you see action uh, for you. So this could be just um, everything's good or maybe just action required or you have to review it. And take a look, and there will be a link provided in your email, a uh, link to the uh, the format QQC report I'll show you later. There are two because one is the, the files you submitted, another one will be after the uh, automatic corrected. So, with two of them, actually, those are um, you actually get a report for each file you submit. So, those are actually this person, which is me. Um, uploaded two files um, in the same upload event, so you get a report for each file. So actually, um, the the original file and the auto corrected file reports are actually bundled together. So these are just two separate files that are uploaded, and you'll see in the other slide the two two attempts for the auto corrected. Thank you. Yep. And this uh, some example about how the QQ, uh, sorry, format QQC report looks like. So green, everything's good. And there's some detail about the, uh, about the information about this submission, right? So which file, and who submit the file, which site is uh, the report is associated with, and also what variable is included in this file. And this is another example of the warning. And there's some, there'll be some information about where uh, this, a warning trigger, and you can take a look at this detail, see if they are making sense or not. The last one will be uh, the, the one with the fail example. Just some, this is another example of that, and uh, just give you some idea. In the report, you'll see the overall status of the, this report, right? And also uh, the recommended action you have to take for this format QC report. And I just mentioned earlier about there are some information about what trigger the warning or maybe issue for this file. Skip that. And before we move to QQC, any question or any show question for now? No, okay. Uh, just briefly about mention about QQC. Um, uh, this presentation is two parts. So I'll come back to the detail of the KQC in the second half. We'll play a little bit again using a pool everywhere. But for now, I'll just mention, so QQC happened after the format QQC, right? So if all your file has the format QQC, then we're ready to go. So we'll kill uh, their QQC wrong. 
And this start with uh, we combine the file. If you're returning side, you're just submitting the last year of data. We'll combine your file with the previous record. So we are doing QQC for the entire record every time. And once we combine a file, we run QQC module. We'll talk about the module, uh, each one of them later. And then someone have to review it. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been doing this uh, a curator or review job for all the data coming to our pipeline. And I put together maybe an email, a show email for you. Uh, maybe an identify issue and try to correct that. And I mentioned earlier, we don't do any data cleaning on our site. And I, later I can show you some number of, of the site we're dealing with. And that's a, one of the reasons we, we don't do any data cleaning uh, on our site. Uh, just to mention, we started this pro new process last fall. Uh, it's called self-review. Um, process so it's very similar right we run the same data QQC module but now for some of the site this is an opt-in process so I think last year we have a, a couple of call and also a training asking people to join this process and right now this is only open to a returning site that means you submitting your data regularly and you have some previous published base already you just submit the last year of data or maybe the last quarter of your data and so you don't have to deal with this, I don't know, 10 years of data at once. It could be a, a hard learning process. So we are open this to a small amount of site, but we are, uh, I think the plan is to moving toward this self-review process a little bit to more site and also more um, in the future. But just to mention, there's a process here. And once the QQC run, we send uh, some of the information uh, to the site team, so including all the figure generated, uh, some of the statistics generated along the QQC module, and we send the information to uh, the site team along with some uh, technical know about QQC detail. And hopefully, they can understand what's going on about the data QQC then take action. So, you can see this path could be faster if you know what's going on. So, you submit the data from the QQC just one day, and you've got an email maybe uh, one or two weeks. Uh, later after you submit your data, then you can take action right away. And this idea is this can go back to the pipeline. Okay. Uh, some idea about the QQC. Uh, this is a, I, there are a lot of things here. I consider this is a secondary independent check of your data. Okay, put it this way. Uh, it's still up to you to do a, main, a primary QQC quality control processing make sure everything's okay for your data. Um, this is what we did here, it's more like an independent check. So we do, it's very different, a little bit different from you did for your site. So we are not QC your data, we are not claiming your data. This is an independent check. And later when we walk into the QQC module, you probably notice that this is very different from the QQC you've done at your site. So we don't have a lot of information. For example, we don't have a diagnostic signal for your sensor, so we cannot rely on that. We don't have other um, thing. We don't have high frequency, high frequency data for your size, so we cannot do a lot of statistic tests for that. So we have to build something based on the half of our data, based on the information we have, but also build upon the community data we see. I think that's another strength of this QQC. So yes, uh, we are um, independent and we do our job separately to make the data better. A couple module here, um, I'm going to show you example later, so I won't go into the detail of them. We check the timestamp alignment, we check the physical range and the vital uh, variation of your data. Uh, we compare multiple variables um, and other things. Okay. Just once the QQC review is over, um, typically you'll receive an email um, sometime in the process. This is a one example. If you haven't seen any email like this before, this will be an example. Just a typical email. See, one thing here is uh, I'll try to summarize uh, the potential issue of your data so you can take action, uh, deal with that. And so this is, if you on the side particip participate in the self-review process, this is a slightly different email you'll see. Uh, I won't go into detail. Uh, you won't see a summarized issue of your site. You, instead, you get a link, a multiple link to the, um, the statistic were generated along the QQC process. 
and the statistic, uh, we have some high level status for each one of them. For example, some where we, we might need to take a look and some is probably okay. And each one of them will be linked to a figure and help you understand what's going on with the data. Okay. Everything works out and everything passed the QQC. Now you're ready. The data is ready to be published on a website. So a couple of things, right? We version the data. That means every time you have a, you have a new uh, release of your data, you have a new version here and they'll be made available as a package on the Merfax website. So each size bundle is one package along with your metadata, so Batum. Uh, all the Batum you provided with the size will be bundled with, along with the FluxNet base there. It'll be made available to download on the Merfax website. And this is a typical way to download your data through a, um, a website user interface and download them by which the site, okay? There are some potential way to download data through API or some other way. If you have issues, just talk to us or maybe another package. Uh, we, we, we have another package uh, use, using R. You can download everything through a pipeline if you prefer that way, that's another option. Talk to me. Then if you are a data provider, it's very, very important to maintain your site page. There are many uh, very useful information about the site, and especially for data user, how to use their data. So site page, everything here will be generated. I think everything here will be generated from your button. So a part of the site general info button, and you can edit that. We, tomorrow we have a button uh, uh, section. We can talk about that later, how you update everything. But the important is this is where the data user find information for each of the site. The photo, maybe the location of your site, contact information, but also some other tab here, right? So DOI is one thing pretty important, how people acknowledge your data, and give you credit for that. So once your data has been published for the first time, we are going to assign a DOI and also uh, some of the information here. You can edit this, right? So if you are long running site, you have certain people just running the site for different period of time. You just want to keep the, some uh, member of your site and the contact information. Or some people maybe have left your lab. You want to give them credit so you can have a separate separate list on the DOI page and a separate list on the active member of your site. So this is doable. You can manage all, everything here on the, this information, uh, the page. And also quite useful for if you're maintaining a site, you want to get credit for about people downloading your data to your funding agency. We have a full list of the uh, checking for who's downloading your data for what purpose and information here. You can download a spreadsheet uh, every time. This is the last slide for the first part. Uh, I just want to mention uh, we started uh, this QRQ, um, not QRQ, uh, the base pipeline, I think a couple of years ago, almost five, six years ago, and we built the entire thing uh, to make this happen. One of the um, I mean, the beauty of the network is it grows so fast. I'm showing some numbers here. The red arrow here, this is where we start building the pipelines back in 2017, a couple of years ago. And the number of the sites submitting data and um, is about 100, maybe. Yeah, I think so, about 100. And in the last couple of years, we see a growth, a huge growth of the people I mean, regions of site submitting their data, and also uh, finally the number of the site we put out for data for people to download. So there's a huge increase in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, we have a, a, a build a pipeline enables to do this work, but there's probably not enough. I mean, I don't know how the trend will be in the next couple of years. So for QQC, we're dealing with almost 400 QQC per year. So there's a lot of data review, and we. You definitely need to keep up with that. Um, well, I, I enjoy uh, viewing all the data coming from everywhere. Um, learn a lot from different ecosystems. Uh, it could be overwhelming sometimes. Uh, and also, we need we need a way to help each other. Any question about the first part about the data workflow before we move on to some exercise about QQC? Do you have something from the chat? I, I want to ask about the sure. missing value. Okay. Uh, that number, we have to put that number in the, in the file before 
Yes, yes. So we're using uh, negative 9999 as the missing value. So use that to be full. Do you have other, I don't know, do you have other preference or I don't know, what is your question? No, because we, in that part, we don't have another, another none. Oh, okay. we have to change all the data. Yeah. We will auto-correct certain common missing values, like NA, I think we catch NAN, NA, so we will auto-correct your file for that. So if you're comfortable with us doing that, we will make that correction, but we prefer if you're, you know, great if you can build your, your own pipelines to use the negative 99. And we realize that that is a valid number for some variables now that we've expanded some of the variables. So we're grappling with that, but um, so but for now we're sticking with negative 999. Any other question about the general workflow or anything? Yeah. What would make it easier for you, Housen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what? When you see a data set come in, what makes you slam your head against the desk and not slam? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, One of the things I was thinking is that a lot of our sites. Re keep resubmitting the full mm -hmm. five years, seven years, 20 years yeah. of data when you probably don't need to do that. You can only you know, look at the first year if you only have a year of data to QC, QA. Is that a lot easier than having to push multiple years through? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that, yeah, well, there are many different conditions, different and that sites. That's so. a problem with versioning too, though. Yeah, for yeah. if you're returning side, yes, that might be an easier way, right? You can just, if you, unless you try to change everything every time, right? Because you can just send the last year of data and you can just interpret what's come out of that. So it's another way. Uh, if you're a new side, uh, I think that some people here are pretty brand new side. Uh, my recommendation would be uh, try not to do everything at once in the beginning. Um, it could be overwhelming, right? So some people I know. I deal with a lot of QQC, a lot of sites get panic. In the first round, they try to submit 100 variables, uh, 10 years of record for the first time, there could be a lot of things to deal with. So starting with something simple, uh, with uh, maybe the first year of the data, one site, and make sure you can you understand the QQC process and run your site, uh, run your data through the process and you understand what's going on. And once you get familiar with the process, then you can start collecting submitting on the side, maybe adding more variable in the future. You can always update your data. I mean, all the time, right? You, you, you publish your first year, then, uh, okay, later I, I, I work out some other, another 30 exam, uh, variable and I can add them back by resubmitting your data, including another 30 variable. So don't, don't try to do a perfect job for the first time and for all your side. I saw a lot of cases, just, people just get panic and never come back. And, <laughs> or maybe taking a longer than you expected to do everything at once. Um, okay, let's play a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, yes. Just kind of on Joe's uh, question, if um, if we are making changes to like our, I guess we're we're submitting on gap filled data, so maybe this isn't an issue, but I'm reprocessing a lot of the the gap filling that we've done on one of our sites. Should I because uh, we normally submit the whole record. If I submit the whole record and it, it is different, should I notate that in any way, or um, how best should I do that? Um, because I'm planning on doing that for two of our sites. I try to understand your question. So if you if you want to update your data for some reason, adding mm -hmm. new variable, or maybe take out some thing. variable, you should yes, you should resubmit the whole record, mm -hmm. replace the whatever record you want to replace. And another thing about annotation or. I just it is can I just resubmit the whole record and that yes. will be included as is uh, yeah. rather than okay great yeah. you can and also when you submit that there's a box when you get the comments which mm -hmm. are really helpful uh, and keep in mind we would rather add non gap field data submit yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. but just to clarify kind of it's a it's a fine difference there but uh, when 
if you're submitting the entire record or just one more year, uh, you will still look at the whole record because there are some uh, metrics that are computed over the whole record. So mm -hmm. from the point of view of the work on our end, that doesn't really change too okay. much if you're submitting the whole record or uh, adding a year. Unless the new record I'm submitting is different in some way from the record you already have. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Just want to add one follow-on to how suggestion. So like go piecemeal and, and build your data if you're especially if you're starting out is if you have multiple sites consider kind of getting one site through the process um it hopefully it would just save you time to kind of then having to redo everything and duplicate triplicate um all right uh I, I talked this for so many times, so I try to do it a different way. Um, I'm going to show you some QQC how we did it, but we're going to do some interactive exercise. So I'm going to show you some good example and also how our QQC module run. And I'm going to show you some example of potential issue and have you play with a little bit to figure out what's going on this side. Um, the first module we, we, we did is uh, this is for time stamp alignment check. So idea behind this is we are we calculate based on your location of the site and your uh, local uh, UTC um, offset. We can calculate the top of the atmosphere incoming radiation for the site. So this is kind of what the, the, uh, the incoming radiation should look like um, on a clear day without all this atmosphere uh, aerosol thing. And based on that, uh, we can try to compute. This is one example, one year of data every window here this is a 15 days window we do the uh, 15 day maximum dino composite so this is trying to get an idea of the clear day radiation and the red one is the incoming radiation and a couple depends on radiation, how many radiation you have we compute that uh, the maximum composite time series for all your all your radiation measurement then we align these two right in ideal case right everything should fall within this incoming potential incoming radiation, right? You might have something in the early sunrise, sunset time uh, because of diffuse, but most of the time your, your measured radiation should be below this incoming radiation. And also the shape uh, between these two, that's your line. So we're doing a cross correlation uh, um, through time to see if they align good or not. And based on this, we can just find the side of the time shift or maybe you have a, I don't know, radiation issue of the site if you're using daylight saving for a certain period of time. And this is one example of everything looks just right, right? So everything's glow, it may be some diffuse in the early sunrise, sunset hour, but everything looks just good. And let's try to play this. Uh, again, using a poor EV, if you pour everywhere, if you can jump into a link. Uh, this is one example I zoom now a little bit, right? So in this case, you're seeing uh, it seems everything shift a little bit uh, earlier, and also the radiation is larger than the potential incoming radiation. So, all right. And it's probably hard to see, but the, this pattern is consistent across all the window here. So for every 15 day window, you're seeing very similar thing, the shift and also higher radiation than uh, incoming, potential incoming radiation. <coughs> Yeah, for this case, it's likely to shift in the timestamp. And based on the cross correlation, it's a two timestamp shift, right? So it's roughly one hour likely for this case. Uh, tilted sensor, possible, but less likely. I mean, tilted sensor, you can see a little bit higher for early morning or later in the room. But typically, if you have a tilted sensor, you have a skew 
just to be I mean, the steel, the shape of the uh, measure radiation should be skewed either toward the morning or toward uh, the afternoon. So it's possible, but most likely this is a shift in your time span, likely one hour. Okay, <coughs> next example. A little bit similar. This time everything sh uh, here. I think from March all the way to October, the potential to shift in the data, but not for the early months and later months. And the shift is probably one or two times then. So a couple of examples. Uh, I hope you can see that. I think if you show, yep. For this case, it's very likely just a daylight saving being used at the side. So you can see the shift happened consistent from I mean, somewhere March, April, all the way to September, October, and not in the earlier, later months. Diffuse radiation could be probably not for this case. If you're seeing a diffuse, you probably have something very consistent, or maybe um, a certain month, not the, the pattern, not that close. Sensor calibration probably not an issue here for this case. All right, moving on to another module we're running. This is just checking the range or variability of your data. Uh, this is very simple, straightforward. So for every variable, we build a, a possible range for this variable. And there are a couple of things we take into consideration. So one is what is a physical possible range for this variable? So some of them we know. That's a D. <laughs> Looking for lunch. And some variable is uh, less, sorry. <laughs> for people on the room. Sorry, that's a fear, that's wrong. Uh, some variable, we probably don't know the physical, there's no defined physical range. So we're using a, um, uh, the range of the, what, all the data we see in the base, right? So we have more than 400 sites receiving right now across different bio and different climate region. So we're using that as an example to view what is the distribution of the higher level and the lower level of this variable. So we, we when the variable gets submitted, we're checking if any variable is outside of this range, okay? And sometimes this can be used, identify uh, maybe it's a wrong unit we use, or maybe the uh, sweet, we have a mis misspecified a missing value, or sometimes there's a site convention in the system. And this could be an easier example. Uh, this case, this is an incoming long wave radiation. And there's some point being flagged here on the end of the record that's being flagged. So in this case, type in your answer. Yeah, in this case, it's yeah, just maybe just likely they're just outlier in the end of the record. Yeah, right. For the the first couple of years, everything is within the within the range, but something happened to the sensor, less of less part of the record, so it's that could be outlier. Uh, just to mention, so I know a lot of sometimes you will see one point, two point outlier data set. So typically we don't rest that uh, unless you have an excessive outlier data set, like a 10%, 20% uh, flat. And usually there's a time we, we, we ask you to do something. If it's just one or two point, um, sometimes you may not see that it grow up. This is a wind direction data. And some period of time, everything's negative here. Uh, so 
the flag. Also, I forgot. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Um, is there somewhere on the Americooks website that you can find um, like those ranges so that we can check our data before submitting? I, you can correct me. I think so. Uh, I can point you to the data. I don't think we have a very branch table somewhere, but again, it varies from site to site, right? It's right. not, it's, okay, so it's not on the website, but we have a, so you have a CSV file. A, no, we have an API oh, okay. that um, the web service, the variable okay. data the web service that I think is public now, right? The coverage? Huh? Are you referring to the coverage? Or? No, the FP variable uh, web service that Oh, well, the variable. That include range. Yeah. Anyway, we can find yeah, it. Yeah, we have a range for this. Um, you see the web service called. Yeah. So yep. that, that, yeah, we can get that. We can, okay. For like specific variables. Yeah, so it's per variable. Okay. We do, um, someone mentioned per site. Yes, we also have those, um, but those aren't available publicly yet. Yeah. Okay. So. If you are dealing with data regularly, you, you, you can imagine, right? So the physical range is pretty wide for some, some situation. You might have an Arctic side, you have a tropical side, they have a very different range, and everything could be just fine within our range. So that's why we have another level of the checking. This is a diagonal seasonal pattern, and this is kind of the, think about this as a, a fine tune range for your side and in a very detailed way, right? So uh, I think the figure here shows uh, monthly. So every every small panel here, this is a monthly being a diagonal pattern of this variable. So this is a diagonal, and the old gray dot here is observation from your sun. And what we did here is, if you're a returning sun, you have a published space in our record. We build something like a, what is the range for your diagonal uh, seasonal pattern for this variable, right? So all the uh, you probably cannot see that very clearly, but all the color here, like uh, the pink, uh, the red one, and also the blue one, this is based on your previous record, what is the range of your data for this variable at this month at the start, for this hour. So this is a monthly diagonal range for this variable for your site. And this is built based on your data. So if you're returning site, we build all this for all the site. And this is a good way to check your range of data. And so using this, you can check a lot of things, right? So if you have something built for this and you have a shift of your variable for this coming last year of the data, it will be flagged because everything will be off the range for this variable. So this is kind of fine tuned range of the variable for your site. And for, but this is only available if you are a returning site and you have some data been cleaned before and we can build that for you. Okay, some exercise. In this example, this is outgoing long wave radiation, and I'm, I'm zooming a little bit for the figure. So all the gray dots are the observation for this year, and the black line is the median for this last year compared to the previous one. New discovery. I like to talk about that. <laughs> and any other? So think about this, uh, I, I didn't mention, all this color line, this is, uh, um, I think it's median and also 25% to 75% and also upper, the, uh, I think the outer one will be 95%, so 95% the previous data, very good. I want to mention this, yes, so the, it's very obvious the data is higher than the previous record and they have a larger uh, increase of the outgoing radiation for this case. And this is a new discovery for this site. And this is real data because the site got burned. So it changed the canopy entirely. So the last year of the data, outgoing radiation is much larger than previous records. So this is new, but something like this can use the human justification about what's going on. But just point out, yes, you have a higher long wave outgoing radiation. Try to figure out if this is real. This is artifact of the data. Another example, this is uh, uh, soil heat fluxes. 
Uh, very, very interesting. You know, last year, uh, everything just, uh, yeah, you can see the figure. Everything is kind of negative compared to the previous record. Everything is there. So it's a flip of sign. Um, I think either they have a processing, a change in their processing code, or maybe the, the sensor just got flipped in the field. So everything now is upside down. So you notice that the range of the data change. Uh, another check we do is uh, we compare multiple variables, right? So typically we compare a uh, show radiation with the incoming power. So this is supposed to be physical uh, related and with some rela relationship between this variable. Also checking you start with wind speed or maybe temperature, different temperature. And idea, ideally, you want to see this is kind of two radiation. They kind of have a, a linear relationship between these two. This is one year of data. And we try to flag whatever the point is outside of this relationship. So um, naturally, there will be some point we flag, but not a lot, and a few points of them. So this is kind of uh, everything expected. And how about this example? We have most, again, Still, the radiation for two on two different sensors. There are some points being flagged, and one thing interesting about all the flag points as always, uh, the power is. Let me check here. One is higher than the other always, and also look at the pattern of the the, the flag point. It happened pretty regularly uh, through the growing season. For this case, this is one of the sensors being shaded. We see this a lot in the, uh, the data. So, because one of them is being shaded, and this only happens during certain period of the time of the day and through the season. So, this is one thing we, we check. Uh, it's not sensor drifting. If you have sensor drifting, you'll be you're seeing something more consistent uh, across the time, not just periodically. And um, this is another example. Uh, in this case, uh, I mean, this is very obvious, right? So they have a perfect relationship between these two. So one of them is being modeled. Um, for the interest of time, we can move forward, skip this case. I want to mention this uh, for this check, uh, you can look at the single year of data, but also can look at a long-term data, right? So this is a multiple year of the data. And we do the, the similar regression for each one each, each year. And then we plot the regression of the R square and also slope along every year, right? So you can see based on the change and also the pattern of the regression slope, you can see if one of them is shifted or maybe changed over the time. So this is something we did. And this is one example, uh, sorry about the scale, but the, the slope of the regression changed very, very slightly over the year. And this is a, some, one good example. And this is another example. Maybe the last one, and we can close this section. So in this case, uh, the showy incoming radiation, if you look at the maximum value, they're pretty stable over the period of time. The PAW, you see, if you look at the peak of the PAW, they change over the time. So there's a Decreasing trend the first couple of years, and then jump up again, and the last couple of years they come to another peak value. If you look at the regression slope, you can see an obvious change of the slope over over the year, right? So maybe five to twenty percent of the change over the year. So yes, one of the sensors might be being swapped, or maybe calibrated, or maybe they just degraded over the period of time, and you can use the, this way to detect. We're not. For the interest of time, we're going to stop here. Um, we, uh, I put a link here. So we have a couple of very, uh, very usable links here. Uh, if you want to dive into the detail of the QQC, so I mentioned earlier, uh, pretty much everything we talked today is on the website uh, for each of the module and how they did. Um, we do have a QQC uh, technical note. Um, if you really want to know the detail of the QQC, 
This is open now to the self-review process. Uh, if you have an interest about learning the QQC, I think we should put a link somewhere on the website. So we can, this is actual detail of how we do each of the QQC module, the statistic behind that, the threshold for each of the uh, things we're setting, and also um, example, good example, or maybe some example of potential issues. So I can, we can share the link for everyone who want to learn. All right, I'm going to stop here. Any question about QQC and data pipeline? Thank you.